Thanks for changing days at short notice, James. Myrid, you requested this for obvious reasons because of what's going on. And I've just had 10 minutes to catch up on James's and Crystal's Facebook to see what's been going on in the world. Yeah, there's just been a gap of time where James hasn't really been... He's been on Facebook, and I'm aware that some people just don't use Facebook. They don't like it, which is fair enough. And if there's not a lot going on at the blog, if there's not an interview that goes up, if there's not something that goes up, then there's a danger that people kind of lose contact and lose touch with perspectives that are really important. And I thought with what was going on currently, it would be good to have an informal talk. If James wants to even introduce a topic, that's great. I wanted to bring up, obviously, the financial situation, what's going on with China and Russia, the explosions that happened in China. And there was one in Japan as well. Just people are just more and more and more on edge now. And it feels like something's building. There's the wildfires as well. Yeah. Well, there's a pattern to all this, and it's not good. And I think that most people have apprehensions in the back of their mind that that have a good inkling. You know, China and Russia are not playing ball with the IMF. They're going their own way, and they're beginning to attract big corporations to do the same thing. Citigroup is moving. Citigroup is sent to half a trillion dollars worth of gold and half a trillion dollars worth of cash to Russia. And one can assume that they're going over to BRICS in preference to IMF, which is in the process of printing money, but hoarding gold and transferring it to Israel as fast as the little mittens can take it. So the collapse of Greece, obviously, as well as people are witnessing that, Well, Greece is a model, and you're right. They're witnessing that, and what they see is to take another bailout where the money goes back to pay interest on a loan that'll grow anyway Mm -hmm. is no answer, and they take and they apply it to themselves. And they see that this credit-debt-based economy can't last. It can't uphold any longevity. It isn't self-sustaining. And it is a tool by which governments are controlled in the strictest terms. I mean, in order to maintain the petrodollar, look how many loops the United States hierarchy in terms of the executive branch of government and the elite are willing to make to keep the situation in the Mideast stirred up. The last thing they want is any alliance between the Arab nations who would probably seek a way to use their own natural resources instead of selling them to the United States and insisting on that oil that is sold elsewhere is paid for in American dollars, which keeps an artificial value on the dollar that is now on the edge of being adjusted because more and more nations in the Middle East that were former members of OPEC are going to start looking at gold-based currency that China is printing, and Russia will probably follow suit, and, you know, say to hell with your American dollars. I mean, this deal is off, and they'll leave OPEC. The basis for OPEC is that you get defense from the United States if you will only accept American dollars for your oil. And, of course... That hasn't helped the economy of the United States any as far as the working class and the blue-collar people because it doesn't get down to us. The prices still go up. They're maneuvered. They're manufactured even. And the only way in which you can stabilize the cost of necessary items, whether it's food or light bulbs, toilet paper, whatever it is, is to have a protective tariff on trade goods that are coming in and being manufactured for cheap labor elsewhere to cover these added taxes, to cover these added services that American people are paying more and more for and get the infrastructure back in shape and stop the privatization of roads. I mean, the more toll roads are opening up in Dallas and Fort Worth every day, than uh, we've ever seen at a time when people just don't have the money 
Mm. <laughs> it's, it's ludicrous. And it's all by design. And it's being executed to create more and more emergency in the lives of Americans, English, Australian, Canadians, to take whatever they can get to be protected from whatever dangers and threats are created to fear monger them. And what do you end up with? You end up with the same kind of price structure, no protection, not trust in your police because they've been militarized, and so forth. I mean, it's a lose-lose situation for the common man, and it won't last that long for the elite because the elite are creating one problem after another for all of us. I mean, Fukushima... Weather control, chemtrails, the poisoning of the environment left and right, uh, it's not going to benefit in the long run. And the long run is almost here. So I think people need to keep one thing in mind. If everything was right with the world but Fukushima, we would still be in deep doo-doo. Yeah. There was a post that Crystal made on your wall a few days ago. People are speculating that it was heart that caused this body of water, which I think was possibly off the coast of France. I didn't get a chance to look at it. I think it was the Atlantic anyway, and the water was changed so that it looked like it was gridded. And yep. you were talking on that thread how that was a display of some kind. It wasn't heart. No, they don't want to admit that anything can come from off Earth that will benefit the people. But at the same time, they want to present some kind of fear because they can't keep the experience so many people have had with off-Earth intelligence, what they've seen in the skies, what some of them have even met. And the stories that are documented, the proof, in many ways, like in countries like Brazil and South Africa, the evidence is on the table. And we know that within the government that there has been contact that E.T. has offered to help, and they wanted to, when they met with Eisenhower, or their concern was the EBs. They wanted to get the EBs off Earth, get rid of them, because, as they said, they were problematic. As I've always said, they're not hostile, but they're problematic. They've interfered with the cultural and technological growth of a nation before it was ready. And they've interfered with other planets, too. So they've been chased around for hundreds of years because they are problematic and they are refuged here. This is the last place that they've been able to find to take refuge from E.T. because they're fed up with them. So they're giving increments of technology that they can to the covert black ops that's misusing it that is trying to create an illusion of uh, hostile alien presence and uh, to stage a, a phony ET attack in order to get everybody to bite that last bullet, you know, and to fully implement the New World Order. Because won't you take anything done to you to be protected from the evil ET? You know, this has been in the wind for a long time in think tanks. Werner von Braun told Carol Rawson, you know, there'll be three stages to implementing the New World Order. And he told her what it would be. It'd be the greenhouse effect, which was the greenhouse effect then. It's global warming now. Then it would be asteroids. And then it would be the phony ET invasion or attack. And, of course, it's, it's not gone smoothly for them because there have been a lot of people that have taken information both from the inside and just by doing their homework and trying to put things together on their own, that AT historically has never done anything to display hostility, that the connivance of so many things, including the inversion of EB into the mess with covert black ops and so many other things that confuse issues like MIBs and like recoveries that crop up in Mexico, that crop up in Pennsylvania, that crop up in South Africa, that crop up in the United Kingdom. All of these happen. And when they happen, people get confused. They say, well, how can these ETs, if they're so advanced, crash? Well, uh, <laughs> most of the crashes are EB, but some of them have been ET. But the, the distinction 
between the two is that ET recovers his people and EB does. So if you use certain guidelines, you can pretty well put things in perspective. But even then, there can be exceptions. You can come across one, and it won't be enough to generalize a conclusion, but it'll give you an idea of the complexity that is involved of what you can expect when there's any truth at all, that there's a multiplicity of sources for these ETs, that they're coming through, that they're doing different things, they're studying us, they're wondering what the hell could have brought us to this impasse. They're concerned. There, there was one flap in Calaris, Brazil, that was extensive and went on for months, that uh, even had a military contingent down there studying while it was ongoing, that probed an entire village. Every single person in that village was probed, including the doctor, a lady. They were very concerned about creating fear. They were very concerned that that didn't happen. So it was non-invasive. How they probed these people was they'd hit them with a beam of light when they were out in the evening. And they did notice that some had taken small bits of skin for biopsies. What was apparently going on was that they were trying to figure out what was going on with us. To get back to the cities of the sea, what intrigued me was what you said about what was happening in the water there was that there was a plea for the remaining cities of the sea not to leave yet. Is that what you were meaning when you made that comment? Or No, you're confusing two things. The cities of the sea are very important. They've left the Pacific. Yeah. If they leave the Atlantic, then uh, they'll be gone. And we will have lost a very important element to the health of this planet because they have the ability, this mass of organisms that make up the cities of the sea, and they're called that because when you pass over them at night and look down in the water, it looks like a city. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the Navy, I saw them, and we would pick them up on radar. And we were always told that they were krell that were coming up, but that doesn't wash. The thing is, they do move, and they are elegant. They can ingest plutonium waste and render it harmless. And that's the purpose of being here. They're a gift. They're a gift to you. Mm. But, of course, uh, you're not shared any of the wonders that I talk about because, you know, you wouldn't have as much awe over the so-called scientists that like to throw their weight around and keep you pinned into an equation that's not going to work for you, it's not going to get you anywhere, and indeed, you know, that wouldn't be true if they had actually been able to find a way to send people off Earth. But they can't. They know that, so they create one hoax after another, and the end product is, you know, people are starting to believe in nothing. And that's the worst state of mind there is, is when you lose all faith in everything because you won't have the will to do anything about what you could otherwise change. So that was kind of, that's right, I remember what we said now, um, it was like a technology that could be used to mitigate the damage that's been done to the oceans. I think there's one person here on Earth today in, uh, in a nation that is favored by off-Earth people, one person that has had contact and th that they have shared some technology with that can help ameliorate and maybe even turn around the damage that's been done to this planet. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, Dr. Cash in Iran. Oh, okay. Dr. Cash. That's interesting. K-E-S-H-E. -E. Yes, that's it. I have friends, uh, one in particular who lives in Thailand, and he follows Cash very closely. I was astonished that Cash was intimating, and some of the things that he said that he may have an off earth source. He didn't come right out and say it, but he intimates it in odd ways, and I listened to a couple of his talks, and I picked up on that. But, of course, most people wouldn't because they wouldn't consider that a viable possibility. And, you know, it is a viable possibility. <laughs> you see these things in the sky 
They occur every night somewhere, and they're making demonstration of what they can do and what conventional craft or what Earth-based human craft here cannot do. And they don't want you to believe on one hand, and on the other hand, they want you to believe. If they can characterize ET as hostile, that works for them. If they have to accept or they have to admit that E.T. is vastly ahead, then hostility would be out of the question because well, there's nothing we could do about it. If people would just use their head, their common sense, they'll reason out of this and they'll see that you put it to these monsters like, well, what is it? Are they hostile or do they not exist at all? Come on, uh, tell us why they're hostile. Tell us why you talk about them, try to build this fear of them if they don't exist at all. You know, come clean. They never will. I mean, they depend on confusion. They depend on fear because fear, when you're fearful of something, you're not that precise. You're not that pinpointing. You're not that holding to account the source of information. Are you? No. Um. James, you mentioned something on Facebook the other day called We're Nearing a Time of the Great Resolve. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit? I think that it's evident. They are boxed in. The monsters call themselves globalists, call themselves uh, whatever. They're boxed in because, first of all, they tried to corrupt Russian leadership, and they do have some fifth columnists in Russia. But, of course, when they tried to promote an oil czar over there that was controlled by the Seven Sisters, the CIA, whatever, because that's who the CIA really works for, that didn't go over. Putin put him in prison. So they had an honest man. I mean, you can talk about ideologies all you want. But if your leadership isn't honest, what damn difference does it make what ideology follows? You can turn anything into rottenness. And that's what's happened here. We have a lot of ideals. America is based on ideals. The Constitution has some of the highest ideals. Is the fruit of the Magna Carta is one of the most wonderful documents. And you watch. You just give an Englishman, you give a Frenchman, you give an Australian the Constitution, he'll tear up when he reads it. He will tear up when he reads it. Now, we have Americans <laughs> that are unfamiliar with the Constitution. They'll tear up when they read it because it really is elegant. And anybody that wants to change that, I'm not talking about trying to make an amendment so that certain things can form with trends that are reasonable, rational, helpful to everybody. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about certain rights that are given as innate. They should never be infringed upon. And we have a Supreme Court to see that they don't, but it's infiltrated. And as I pointed out, who's infiltrated it and who they are. And they're voting, or the ones that will vote not to review an act of law, a practice of law, or an amendment, or anything that comes down as an executive order, whatever, on the grounds of its constitutionality, because they can have it revoked, and they're not doing it. Oh, there's one man in there that is always upset because of the way the others vote. <laughs> and that's Thomas, <laughs> who's been given such a bad rap for being a womanizer. But he tries to uphold the Constitution, but he's only one of seven that are voting on the constitutionality of anything filed for them to review. To continue with the statement that you made, we have so many things in play at the moment, but I would imagine that they're not stupid. They know the environmental crisis that is unfolding, some of which is deliberate. I believe that um, some of those fires were started deliberately. There was that blog statement, Dr. Williams, somebody or other. There's a claim that somebody was seen from the UN lighting one of the fires, starting up the wildfires, and I can believe that. So... It's like this guerrilla warfare that's going on. You've read what I wrote on my Facebook wall. Mm -hmm. Why would they light fires? Well, (laughs) 
that's cover for rebels that are fighting back. They're going to have to find an area to recon, to live in when they're not fighting. So the UN comes in years ago, administers the national forests now. And, you know, these people that are disappearing are probably stumbling on some of the devices that they use or will use to actively oppose any kind of privacy, any kind of hiding, any kind of ability of guerrilla groups to survive. You know, whether they're a form of weapon, whether they're surveillance or whatever, they're in there. And if they stumble on them, then, you know, that lets the cat out of the bag and it's easier to disappear them than it is to reprogram them or whatever. So that's what's going on. Now, how they do it uh, could also involve EBs. It could involve just black helicopters with anti-noise devices. It could involve a number of things. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't look to it being a single method by any means. That's one thing that confused people because they see a different pattern. They think, oh, well, there's got to be different causes. Well, no. No. It could be one cause using different methods. It's just so, like when 911 fell, it was evidently nuked. A nuke is the only thing that can turn reinforced concrete and steel to powder. It's the only thing. You can talk about exotic weapons all you want, but they won't do that. Mm-hmm. So that's the only thing that they've got that'll do that, and that's what happened. I go along with Dmitry Kalisov and what he claims in his work, The Third Truth, that these nukes were installed in those buildings at the time they were built because they were the tallest buildings on Earth at the time. They had to prove that they could come down with controlled demolition, doing the least amount of damage to the buildings surrounding them. So in order to get their building permit, they had to prove at the time there was different attitude towards nuclear energy. So... Dimitri, who was in the KGB, and his job was to monitor all the reports that they were getting from any nation that was a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty at the time, the Soviet Union, United States, and other nations, a number of other nations, had to report any use at all of nuclear energy, whether it was weapons, whether it was peaceful or whatever. And so that was reported, and uh, he read the reports. He could give the strength of these detonations. He could tell you the range of effect they would have, and he did. And it conforms to the evidence. I believe that nuclear energy is devastating us more than it ever could have been conceived to help us. Mm. It is, is not profitable in terms of producing electricity. It's profitable to sell. And since the Queen of England owns most of the uranium deposits, uh, you know, she's making the killing. No one else is, except the people that are given jobs or uh, given some reason to perform and, you know, are making money as far as what's petering down to them. But nobody in their right mind is going to benefit, is going to see any benefit from this soon. The other thing I attempt to get across to people again and again is they keep saying, oh, well, you know, the elite aren't going to win and it'll all be fine, we'll go over the hump or whatever. The thing is, that even if that was to happen tomorrow, we still need the help exactly. from off yeah. planet. We cannot, yeah. we cannot stop Fukushima without the technology that the extended community has and clean up all that has already been distributed throughout the planet, you know, atmospherically and in the seas and so on. And it's in our bodies now. It's four years and counting. And not just Fukushima, we've accumulated so much from other nuclear disasters plus the testing and so on. So, yeah, I think I agree that we have to stop that. But the other thing I wanted to touch on as well and Tors will know about this because she watched the same series. We talked about that series, Sensate, and one of the reasons we talked about it was because I had a conversation with James a while ago where I had one of those moments where I understood something, but I couldn't explain it, and I probably still can't explain it. 
But I finally got <laughs> what he talks about when he talks about genetic memory in that. And we talked about this again the other day, James. We were talking about Egyptian magic and all the various things that were used and aromatherapy came up. And once again, we talked about the sense of smell and how when you smell something, and this is scientifically known, it's been written about, it connects immediately to part of the brain, stimulating memory and recall. So say, for example, in my case, the smell of honeysuckle takes me right back to when I was a kid on the Isle of Skye, and it used to grow wild around the gate of this old lady that lived there, and I have a very magical memory of that time. And it was that moment where I thought, if people could understand how collective consciousness, if we had it worked, or even genetic memory, because that link, as you were explaining it, James, to genetic memory is not just my past lives, it's something more that I would be able to connect to. Is that right? Am, am I rambling? No, no, you're not. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about because it's one of those things that people with split consciousness from time to time access very shortly. It's one of the things that I talk about where people develop a method that extends that, like in divining or reading a tarot deck mm. or a Ouija board. You can lump any and all of that into divining. And what it's doing, you are permitting. You found a way, a method, in which the subconscious and the conscious mind stop their struggle and join for just a little while. Mm. And then, of course, the conscious mind says, uh oh, we're getting too close, and you're going to say something that's going to offend somebody. You're going to be ridiculous and absurd because you remember things too well, and that'll depress me. That's what's going on. You see it in people whenever you try to approach them about something that they don't want to believe. And they will be incredulous, not just because their common sense or their perception is being challenged. They're concerned about where we're going into my private life. Mm. You know, I mean, how much of the current affairs touches on people's perception of themselves. Huh? Yeah. And this current affair might be about, you know, the reporting of some incident or what might be about something that challenges their perception of themselves. Mm -hmm. But we like to believe that we are the best there are, that there's nothing better anywhere than us. And that may be true in terms of values as humans and as people and as sentient life. But it may not be true with technology or with uh, knowledge or a number of other things. You know, one of the things we base everything on is power. How fast our car can go and all that. You got something that can go across a galaxy in a lifetime. Then <laughs> you got something that's really fast. But of course... It kind of takes all that steam away from the ego, doesn't it? Well, the other thing that we talked about with that series that I thought was really amazing about it as a storyline was the fact that each character went through a process of growth and they all turned around and did the right thing. One character, for example, was a bad guy, you know, a thief and whatnot. But when they discovered that ability, part of that ability in going through that was having a moral core. And exactly. that's what was so exactly. beautiful about the story, and that's why I wanted to talk about it. Because I know when we get together, we talk about a lot of really serious stuff, but we quite often don't record us talking about, if we get over the hump, how amazing okay. it will be. And I personally need hope. I know Taurus and Shuni need hope. I know everyone out there listening needs hope. And even if they can't quite handle what we say and they go, ah, oh, that's... But even if a little seed of it is planted... And they think, oh, right. And then they look at the well, EMVs or, you know. But it's understanding that potential in each of us as well. Because oh, yeah. like one thing that happens a lot in the truth movement or the so-called truth movement is people calling other people sheep and people referring to humanity as, oh, if human beings went on this planet, all the animals would live happily ever after. You know, I love animals it's, as well, but I know you, you know, do. And it's, it's crazy some of the things people say, and in terms of not valuing each other, and we're all in this together. We have well, to. There are people who practice extremism because that's what they see their leaders doing. Yeah. Once that they understand the evil 
that they are being subjected to, they overreact or they react in ways that are understandable but not rational or not wise. They know that they are victims of an agenda. They know that. So their idea is to create an agenda of their own, mm. right or wrong. And that's what they do because they just know that if they can get people to stop eating meat or if they can get people to stop smoking or to stop drinking, that maybe all this other stuff will go away. Well, that happened back during women's suffrage. Women had amassed political power. And then they turned around and traded for prohibition. Because they just knew that men would straighten up and fly right if they didn't drink. So what did that get us? Did men stop drinking? No. They found ways to get around that. It gave crime a monopoly. Organized crime got a monopoly off prohibition. And when prohibition went away, they substituted drugs. Of course, there'd always been opium here. There'd always been opium dens here. The English brought that habit to the Chinese. The Chinese socialized it and brought it to the United States when they started working on our railroads. And, then, and, and you know, it always comes home. I don't care what evil you commit elsewhere. It's residue comes home. Mm -hmm. There's so many lessons that you could learn from history if you knew it. But you're not getting enough of the truth, enough of the relevant truth, the significant truth, and what's taught. There are professors that try, and they get into trouble. And they have to worry about being baited by their own students. I was accused one time of baiting a professor that I dearly cared for because I kept asking him about the long march. And then... <laughs> You see, he came right out in class and said, are you trying to bait me? And I said, oh, my God, I realized that I was uh, in sensitive waters. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, I regretted that. But that's what you face with education here. You know, and I knew we were all in trouble when Berkeley decided that people revisiting history and rewriting it out of uh, desire for it to be more truthful historic revisionism were banned from the university at berkeley university of california at berkeley i should say um jane but could you give us your take on the explosions at Tianjin in china because i mean the videos were quite spectacular and i watched it and thought god that's a nuclear explosion that and is some... might have had some ordnance <laughs> might have had some chemicals or whatever but it was detonated with a nuke well, it certainly looked like it. I mean, the, the second yeah. lot of teacher came out a couple of days later from the gentleman in the flat. I mean, that was just, it was shocking, absolutely shocking. But what is your take on it? I'm just having a quick look at, I think it's Jim Featherstone's website. And there's talk of, I had time to look at it, it's a Hillary report or something like that. Something to do with Hillary's emails. I, I have no idea. And I just thought, I wondered if you knew more than me. Well, I noticed that. I didn't get into it. I don't know what Hillary's emails would have to do with it. It could have, because she was very callous. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm not a fan of the Clintons, especially her. I wouldn't put anything past her. Spinning confusion and trouble and strife is about all that this administration, or I call it regime, has left in order to affect what it wants to affect. And that is one emergency after another so that they can declare martial law and keep their fat ass in the White House indefinitely. One of the orders of the day was that the trends that are set to follow up on, like all the trends that are supposed to lead us to being microchipped, to having our guns and everything, to turn us into a subjugate police state before they start depopulating, all these trends which are set up are yet to be fully facilitated, and uh, that was to be the finishing touches applied by Hillary Clinton. But now she shot herself in the foot, so there are other contingencies being brought forth. God forbid. 
And this is part of it. And I think because China and Russia have sorted this out about this globalism and the way the IMF is disappearing people's gold that's stored with them and printing more money than should have ever been printed and not just American dollars, but operating in a way, a more desperate way to steal the wealth of nations, turn it into gold and to take it to Israel. And this is evident to anybody that's paying attention to what's going on, like what happened to the gold that was in Building 7. It was moved out of Building 7, and a lot of people saw it being moved in the days before 911. All of this has been discussed over and over again in the alternative media among people, but it seldom is put together well so that people can actually have a clear idea of the trends that are going on around the world in respect to nations that are victims of this debt economy scam. They brought Greece down to her knees. It's sad. It's pathetic. Greece had one military junta after another and was, of course, ripe for the worst element of this kind of credit economy and was exploited to the hilt and now is in a situation where they understand what bailouts really are. They're not helpful. They don't get anybody anywhere. They put you deeper in debt. Yeah. All the money goes to pay off interest on what you owed prior. And so the out for Greece is real simple. Declare all debt null and void, move to bricks, you know, start life over again. Yeah. I mean, there's no other choice. And, of course, there are some economists that have modified views of that. But essentially, mine's a little more extreme than theirs. But it'll work. It is not a matter of cheating anyone. It is a matter of recognizing that you've been scammed and holding those people that have scammed you accountable for the mess and saying, you're not stealing any more of my blood. Go to hell. You know, that's what it boils down to. But, of course, the prime minister of Greece was in on it. He was dirty. He wanted to go for the bailout, which gets him nowhere. It didn't get us anywhere. What did it get? It got a lot of multimillionaires to become billionaires who Good. had put their banks, who had put their financial institutions in the sorriest position imaginable, stealing money, and they got more money. And now those institutions might be making some money. They might be getting somewhere. But, you know, the same thing will happen again. And I'm sure that the capital, the investment capital that is being denied right now to small business, left and right, so reminiscent of what happened in 1929, <laughs> that those people that were in, you know, middle class people, that thought the bailout was a good idea, are learning very quickly that it wasn't for them. It wouldn't have bailed out anybody but the people that caused the problem. Well, it's like putting a plaster over a burst artery, really, isn't it? <laughs> no amount of bailout schemes, low interest policies or, or you know, quantitative easing is going to put that plaster over what happened in 08, because in 2008, because seven years down the line, it's plainly not working. And, and we're looking at, you know, global market meltdown. It, but people don't see it, though, because eight years is a long time in people's memories and they get complacent. And, but people are poor people are hungry and when people have no money they stop buying products which are then stopped imported let me just gently read this and i'm going to have to say who it's from it is from the gerald salenti website because crystal posted it earlier on and it's really interesting everything is collapsing because of the world economy is imploding there's a formula here and i have to quote it because it says at the bottom that it cannot be broadcast unless you quote it 
So it says, when the US and Europe buy fewer consumer goods, China manufactures less of them. And the less China manufactures, the fewer raw materials and agricultural goods it imports from resource-rich nations. As resource-rich nations export fewer raw materials, their economies dramatically weaken, their currencies sink lower, inflation rises, unemployment rapidly goes, and out-of-work cash-poor consumers consume less. This is exactly what is happening. And in the UK, we have an influx, absolute influx of refugees from cash poor countries with absolutely nothing. That's the and same in Germany too. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and Europe in fact I was now. watching it, yeah. I was watching it tonight, the refugees trying to get into Germany. They're like, we need to get to Germany. And it's horrifying because people put down and demonstrate against refugees, yet it could just so easily be us. Just so easily. You can't have economic policies that they have put into place with these trade agreements like NAFTA and GATT in the United States. You can't have these and not have this as the inevitable outcome. They have propped up this economy in the United States as much as they have with the petrodollar. Now that the petrodollar is being challenged, it's all going to go to hell very quickly. It is. Now, they're confusing issues. They're throwing this around. They're talking about recession. They're talking about, well, we have depression and recession both now. Mm. You know, I don't care who you are unless you're a big thief. It's benefiting off of the social inequity of this system, like you're a, a CEO or on the board of directors of AT&T or Citibank or some other corporation that is sucking on the government teat and getting away with it. Unless you're there, you know, I don't care who you are, whether you're a scientist or whether you're a doctor or whatever. <laughs> You're not far from a bread line. You're a not of, far yeah. from a bread line. Now, I mean, there are no necessary jobs when there are no necessary people. And this is what no one here understands. They're going to understand it. I hope they understand it before it's too late. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that, James? Well, you have to look at who's it's, got the money. And if you're not necessary to them, they consider you a useless eater, don't they? Yep. They don't care whether you're a doctor or a scientist. They're killing them off left and right because they don't say the right things. They don't care what the truth is either. What are the right things for them to say? Lies. Lies about vaccines. Lies about bioorganisms that are genetically weaponized. Uh, lies about weapons that uh, that exist and nobody knows about lies about the energy grid and how it can be converted to a anti insurrection weapon uh, and you know things that there were uh, classified documents on and papers written on 20 years ago and you talk about this a lot, about how the technology exists in our homes, the technology exists around us everywhere. And like you just said, anti-insurrection technology, it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it oh. is. And, you know, there are people now, I was saying a long time ago about the cell towers and about how cell phones and smart technology and all this, how it will have such a great downside that people should be fighting it. You know, it's no different in many ways than accepting a chip. It's no different. And Everyone's I, conditioned into it. There's the, the love are. of the, the cell phone. You don't they see anyone that, now without a cell well, phone. You know, if you had to go without electricity and use kerosene lamps and uh, wood stove or whatever, in two years or less, you'd adjust to it. I adjusted it three days ago in camping. I welcome yeah, well, it. You know what I'm talking about then. Yeah, and that's and, why I'm uh, camping. You know, there is nothing they provide. When you really get down to it, there is nothing that they provide that's worth the price we pay for them providing it. No, it's not. When you consider what comes with it. When you consider what comes with it. And it's less and less. And today... What services we do we get for our money? 
And where has all this money that they've saved gone? It certainly hasn't gone into any health benefits. It hasn't gone into Social Security. It hasn't gone into the infrastructure. Where's it gone? Well, when you hear about $16 trillion that the military cannot account for, well, then you know where it's going. Yeah, it's going to second technology and development, R&D, and God knows All right, it's yeah. going to the people that are selling those people, the planes, the equipment that they need or whatever. It's going to the military-industrial complex. That's where it's you, going. Something I need to discuss with you, because I've confirmed it virtually now, and it's very, very noticeable. I go camping because, A, I enjoy camping. And when I do go camping, I tend to go to areas where there is very, very little cell phone coverage. So, therefore, I disappear for days on end. Now, what's interesting is this. You know, when you get out in the air, people say, go out into the countryside, you know, it's good for you, it relaxes you. Yes, it does. But what's even more interesting is if you go to an area that has virtually no cell phone coverage, so your phone is pretty much useless because you can't even get a text, let alone a phone call, this this, this silence, and I, I can't even describe it, it's like a mind silence just settles over you. It's almost like... An annoying itch has been taken away, but it's it's not on the outside, it's inside you. And you do, you completely relax. And it's like, oh, okay, it's quiet. But not just because of where you are. Now, what I've noticed many, many times is when I come back to the house, back to the Wi-Fi, back to the computers, back to cell phone areas, when I'm lying in bed at night trying to get to sleep, there is an incessant chatter of sorts and it's nothing definitive but there is a definite chatter of noise that is just there all the time and it's becoming more and more noticeable every time I go away to somewhere where there is no coverage and then come back home and for the first three or four nights it's like someone's playing a stereo right in your bedroom and you're trying to sleep but it's inside your head and I want to know if other people have experienced this or whether or not. I don't think it could be just me, to be honest, because I've spoken to a few other of my friends. But this must be the technology that they're using to control a population, to bombard us with thoughts. You know, we know they can do it because they're advertising on trains now, whereby the thoughts will be just in, bombarded into your head. Now, this is not something that I want to happen at all. But I thought it was worth mentioning because it's been so prominent recently with me having gone away and then come back again that I wanted to discuss it with you. But I don't want to go down the road of my control, manipulation and God knows what else. But it's just something that I've noticed that is obvious, that chatter, that noise, white noise, call it whatever you want. Well, I think there are groups of people that are affected different ways by microwave. Some people have tinnitus, and uh, they have no reason to have tinnitus other than microwave. I've talked to some, because I have tinnitus, and I've talked to some, and they say, no, I've never been to a concert, wasn't in artillery or whatever, you know, so I don't know why I have this. And you can't attribute it to a loud noise or something. We have these hair-like feels in our ears you know tinnitus is they lay down and they don't ever get back up and that's the source of tinnitus supposedly but that's not how i got mine i got mine from working at the computer you know that's the only variable that i know of in my life that led to it now i, I don't think get these high-pitched noises when i'm away at all that high-pitched noise i don't get it you yeah. got a simple solution be thankful that you found it and don't use cell phones don't use Wi-Fi. These are the easiest ways to affect a person's environment with electronics. There's Wi-Fi everywhere. You can't get away from it anymore. Well, it has an effective range, and then it has a residual range. And, uh, you know, there are things that you can do. One of the things that I recommend that people do is to maintain their mineral content in their body because uh, microwave or any kind of radiation will affect the balance of magnesium and calcium in your body that you need for the brain to work normally. 
It's the same problem that you have when you fly. their are pilots that can't get insurance if they're driving home after a flight because the insurance companies know what I'm talking about. Microwave radiation is greater at higher altitudes than it is at lower altitudes. <laughs> you know, there's so much study that's been done on this that the results of it lay back. They're not told to the American people because, you know, big business is protected. The government protects big business. Let's face it. People really understood, you know, that they can't believe a damn thing that is relevant to their health and relevant to their security as a consumer if it rankles any big corporation because they're not going to get the news, the true news about anything in that respect or in that subject coming from a broadcasting network that's selling commercial or that's taking money for commercials, these people offer them. I mean, that is their bread and butter. So we lay it on individuals who, you know, like Murdoch and Ted Turner and so forth, who are monsters, who take the high hand and who have made it worse. But this all began when public broadcasting networks started taking these subsidies and these donations from IBM and from AT&T and all. And just look, look at the credits sometimes and see who is... You know, it's not the public that's giving them money. It's big corporations. And, the, of course, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox, all of them, they're in the same boat. Fox is better than the others? Big deal. Not that much better. Yet still they will produce programs like Sensei. It begs to differ. Like it's Look, Sensei's fiction. Yeah. It's fiction. That it's about something that's not fiction, that people don't know about, that's something else, but they don't know about it. Then they will just tell, you know, it's a treatment. And it's worse in some ways than not producing it at all because when people do come up against the paranormal, let's call it the paranormal, and they come up against it, they can always say to themselves, oh, well, I saw that on TV, it's just fiction. Exactly, yeah. That's so, a treatment. Yeah. Yeah. They're so good at treatments. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen some of the most fantastic things on the History Channel and on the Science Channel and all these channels, you know. And yet, they're treatments. Mm -hmm. They don't go far enough. They are not shown long enough. They're not talked about enough. They're not reviewed enough to stick. They're treatments. Oh, I think I saw that. Oh, I saw something about that. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore it becomes diminished in such a way that people become it jaded. Becomes, it's and more incredible. Yeah. And also they don't question. They don't sort of, it's like their wonder is, is, is taken away in a sense. You know, that questioning that we have as children is answered by these so-called treatments. So, and if they're going to school, they're not learning anything other than what, they're taught when we know what they're taught is generally wrong or it's it's diminished somehow as well. So it's really effective and it gets you nowhere. I mean, the reason I used Sensei was just as an example of something that was interesting because some of it was very similar to what you've talked about when it comes to the genetic memory, but it was a tiny part of that, just a tiny part of it. And I think because we're hungry to look for examples when, you know, we're looking for things to explain to other people and we well I know I sort of latch on to it immediately and think wow that's so interesting because that's similar to what James has talked about you know there's been a few series like that but nothing compared to what the real thing would be you know mm. not even close I, I, I think you know lately in the last few weeks I've been going back over systematically watching the X-Files yeah, I've noticed. And you know, I have finally decided, I mean, there are a lot of interesting things there. A lot of interesting things. But you know what I think is the most important thing about the X-Files? I think that it's the interplay between, between Scully, Scully and, and Malden. Yeah. Because uh, Scully has taken it upon herself to be a cynic in the face of 
overbearing evidence. You know, she's constantly prating this dogmatic pragmatism. Constantly. I don't care if you have no inkling whatsoever about the science or the medicine behind it, some of her explanations or the things she's groping for, because the last thing she wants to admit is that Mulder has got an insight that, as bizarre as it might seem, is the only one that explains a damn thing about what is going on. Mm -hmm. And she'll hold out and hold out and hold out, and she will go from episode to episode the same thing. And even though from one episode may be related to another and may reinforce what's happening in that next episode, it's starting all over again each time with the pragmatic BS. And she can't help it. She's honest. She's good-hearted, she's sincere, she's dutiful, but she's a pragmatic dunce. <laughs> I, I can't say it any other way. And, oh, and you although you, <laughs> yeah, and you yeah, just want to ring her, you grab her and just wring her throat, you know, <laughs> sometimes. But the part she plays is... That is essential, yeah. is it not? Because but, if yeah. you think about when the X-Files came out, it was the early 90s, was it not? I mean, it was ahead of its time in many, many ways, and I think that was brilliant oh, writing, in yes. that it had Scully, and unfortunately poor Scully is a woman, I, I'd be interested to see how it would be if it had been the other way around. Yeah. If Mulder had been a female and Scully had been a male, I remember I don't think that. it would have sold. I don't think it would have well, sold yeah, because, because, uh, well, because of the way society is. It would have been fair. Believe me, I, I know women that are a lot more easy to reach and to talk to and to, yeah, you know, introduce the new ideas in men. They're also than men. More open, yeah. a lot more open-minded, excuse me, but I think we are as you're a gender. More, you're more open and you're more appreciative of new ideas than men. Now, when you come across a man that has that kind of creative brilliance that women have, in abundance, but has that and then has the formal education and the things to back it up, the only difference will be is that he will be more poignant because he will stick by his guns more than a woman will. A woman will sit there and she'll get, you know, muddled or whatever because she wants to be fair. Men don't worry about being fair. When they latch on to something and they believe it, they don't worry about being fair. And women do. And that's the drawback between women and men. Although, you know, I like women for the way they are. But as far as winning a debate, they are hampered by their sense of subtlety. They don't want to be confrontational, number one. Number two, well, no one wants to be confrontational. Even the mean ones, they don't want to be confrontational. Yeah, I'm but, my sister. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there are exceptions, and the exceptions throw you for a loop sometimes. If somebody said, well, I got this idea, and it's really out there. See if you can convince somebody. Nine times out of ten, I'd choose a woman to try and convince of that idea. If that's put on the table to me to see, well, you think you can introduce something really new that's really out there and find an open-minded person, I would choose a woman over a man any time. Not that they're duped. Uh-uh. Women are practical. Women are just as practical as men. They're just not as uh, aggressive about their opinions and as aggressive when they make up their mind as men. I also That's think you have to look at the character background as well in that Scully, she was kind of classic with the father issues and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. And uh, she also wanted to trust the government. So you're using that character as a vehicle. If you're a writer, then you have to have that playoff between characters, oh, have, which is why it have, works yeah. so well. That's because right. she's going to do what one half of your brain does whenever you're trying to convince yourself of something. Because that's what happens. Just, you're going, oh, it, I'm seeing a UFO. No, you're not. I wouldn't criticize that series for its writing or for its casting or anything else. I think it's as far as epi series on television, it's just incredibly remarkable. And it won a number of Emmys. Yeah, well, it's brilliant. It's really yeah, cool. it covers things that were unthinkable to touch. 
it goes off in the wrong direction sometimes, but it's well-meaning. I mean, it's not doing it for political reasons. It's doing it because that's just the way the people that were writing saw it at the same time. Of course, it has a host of writers. It has different writers. And it has to have, because one man couldn't do that. Ten men couldn't do that. There are probably 20 writers that contributed to that series. Most of them are pretty good. But there's some things I take issue with. You know, that's why I am. <laughs> I take issue with a lot of things. I tell you what other TV series we watched recently, and it's not like we all watch TV all day because we don't. However, I don't watch normal telly because I like to watch a series if I get hold of it. Is Humans, it is a series that is very well worth watching. As a general surmise, artificial intelligence has become so lifelike that unless they have these bright green eyes, it's impossible to tell the difference. But they're programmed for individual tasks to help humans and make their lives easier. The developer that developed the actual artificial intelligence discovered a way to inject consciousness into a certain few of them and he did it for a specific reason because he lost his wife and when his son was dying he then retrofitted him so that he had to be plugged in in order to survive because he'd become part human part machine but he discovered a way to embed within a few of them um, the ability to reason to think to hurt to love to cry to have pain so therefore they became humans which is the whole aspect of the series and watching it develop and the ethics that it questioned and made you think about fascinating tv series well let me tell you something that was discovered a long time ago about artificial intelligence anything programmed can be overridden anything programmed can be overridden it's like Already having something set up to be a Manchurian candidate, you don't want that. No, you don't, don't want that option. No matter how nice it might seem to have a sympathetic robot, or how nice it might be to have a a lady in the hay that is an android. Ah. You, you see X Machina. I've seen the trailer, but I can imagine it's uh, quite well done, and especially how it ends would leave a lot of people thinking of how it was not such a good idea. It's the same reason that you wouldn't want to get a hybrid gorilla or an orangutan, mm -hmm. because these are gregarious animals, and you never have a population of them, so that means you're creating something that is gregarious and is going to suffer from it because they can't find a population to be gregarious with. So you're doing something inhuman. You know, you're creating something that is going to suffer by being created. And the same is true by creating something that you produce artificial intelligence in and then give it in order to keep it from being problematic. You give it uh, more and more sentience or what you consider sentience to be more and more a complement of that sort of thing and you don't realize at the same time that this is a loaded gun because anybody uh, even accidentally can override that because it's a piece of an equipment and you're apt to forget that and get lazy or slouchy with it and one day you come home and it's killed everyone in the house and it's out on the streets killing everyone it can find there and this is the ethical question as to whether or not artificial intelligence should ever be invented. Okay, if you look at it this way, there have been movies made on this, and a lot of them are in apprehension of something very real. Like a computer that has artificial intelligence has a form of creativity that it can say, well, what if I take control of every electrical appliance and I set it up to do this and set it up to do that? And now it has power. Mm. It has power over your environment. You know, anybody can run the wrong kind of program in it. Who knows how far, how completely it can go one way or the other, but still not have the fullness of sentience to be anything other than pragmatic with life 
You don't want something that's pragmatic with life. That's the kind of crap that has created this idea of depopulation. Mm -hmm. You don't want something that's pragmatic with eugenics or anything like that. And they can't be anything but pragmatic about it because you have put it in that problem-solving mode that justifies anything that it does, just like these monsters. And you can bet that the industry that builds this shit will be who is creating these things. And it does such a wonderful thing about creating the situation on the earth today, like Fukushima. You, yeah, i tell you which movie perfectly depicts that, and I watched it about three weeks ago. It's a movie with Johnny Depp, and it's called Transcendence. Have you seen it yet? No, that's no. the one that's sort of transhumanist. He it tries is. to come back. Yeah, I've not seen it. It's shockingly worrying. I don't want to give it away, but in the end, there is no stopping him because he's everywhere. If you step back from this, the problems are too great to risk. Mm. The benefits are not essential. When people are looking for work, do you need robots? No. 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 <laughs> but the thing is, is people do not want to do the menial jobs the excuse that is made is that, oh, well, you know, in the future we're going to have all these old people, so who the hell's going to look after them? That's one of the things, arguments that's put. Oh, well, you know, that's a bunch of crap. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know it is. None of it holds any water. And if people would just think for themselves, they'll know right off that that doesn't hold, that that is not a problem. The other thing that was good about Jade Helm was how much came out about the so-called artificial intelligence that was involved with that, with the sort of full-spectrum dominance thing and data mining. I mean, how much well, of that do you think was a lot of swanky nonsense? I mean, are they being... It's a nice way of escaping accountability, isn't it? Blame it on the machine. Yeah. Oh, this is the machine. we got to do this. And the machine is telling us that this is the option we have to take. Yeah, well, a machine needs to be programmed by somebody, and like you quite rightly pointed out, a machine can be wiped and reprogrammed at any point. This can become a dictate, just like you can take different kinds of criminology, like, you know, the thought criminal and all that, and you can use that as a justification to incarcerate anybody, no matter how good or innocent or whatever they are, because that's convenient to the powers that be. And you can do the same thing with anything that's programmable. You can fix it so that it does something sinister to anybody but a very select group. And transhumanism is a ploy. People say, well, what about Fukushima? And you say, well, we just make people that'll thrive on Fukushima, you know, which is a biggest lie there is. Radiation even destroys metal. It's caused metal fatigue in the aircraft. Those cranes melting at Fukushima because of... Look, there's no upside to radiation contamination for humans or for organic critters mm -hmm. like us. We're organic critters. We're not ever going to thrive on radiation. We can't be made to be able to thrive on radiation. Now, there's a fluke every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't base an entire method of science or production or anything else on a fluke. Most flukes can't reproduce anyway. We call them mutations. Well, that's not really what they are. It's something that happens when you stress an organism and the genetic determinants are stressed to change for survival. But only in extremely rare instances can this be passed on to the offspring, like a mutation. And mutations can more, but whether or not that'll be a helpful mutation to the species to survive, that's another question. James, I was just reading something that's really interesting. You're talking about genetic mutations, about genetic selection, about how a certain race of people on this planet wants to be the only race on this planet, and therefore, because God willed it, they will wipe out every other race on this planet. And it can be done with a simple injection, which the... Um, now, I don't know the technical term to this, but basically it then affects the genetics within the ovaries and it affects the genetics of the sperm, whereby when they are then joined, 
the specific traits that are wanted will only ever be given to any children from that point onwards. So any previous genetic traits are completely wiped out. And I will have to mention that I did find this on Jim Featherstone's website, and it was quite an interesting read. Well, they're going the other way, though. They're way? developing smart vaccines and smart pharmaceuticals, not necessarily vaccines. They kill people of certain races. Yes, it's genetic cleansing, in other words. Yeah, they've done that in Africa already. But it's done by not so much a smart protocol or a smart type of vaccine or whatever. It's done by the batches of antibiotics or ophthalmic ointment or whatever that are sent there are good only for the short term period because they don't have enough of the infective ingredient to wipe out the bug. But the bug will come back and be even stronger and this time immune to any antibiotic or any kind of medication. And so the end product is death. Because in a nation that is having a great deal of poverty, where it's dog eat dog, to lose your eyesight is death sentence. Mm. So there have been specials on network television about the pirated drugs in Africa and where they come from, because they all have batch numbers, they all have the wrappings and everything, whether they're bubble-wrapped or whatever they are, that the legitimate drugs have. And they are legitimately coming from the companies that make the legitimate version. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's what inspired John Le Carre to write Constant Gardener. Also right. Exactly. Well, if I had to say that today that there was a Frankenstein muck. It wouldn't be a politician. Who it would be would be the CEO of one of these pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. And it's not just him, because he is driven to improve the bottom line for the board of directors and stockholders every year. And if he doesn't do that, then, you know, he's going to lose his position. And that's all that it means to him or he wouldn't be there. It's just like in politics, you know, if you're not a certain type of person, your chances of getting that money for your election campaign, pretty low. You don't get money from APAC unless you will swear to support Israel, right or wrong. You don't get money from the AMA or from any of the concerns that channel money for big business. You're not going to get any of that money. So you're going to end up like some of the people that are whistleblowers or like some of the people that Ralph Nader, you'll end up like them. You'll be a voice, but it won't carry. Look at the Pauls, Ron Paul and Rand Paul. Look at them. They're a voice, but they don't carry. They don't have the means to do it. Some people think that they're strong men. I don't think they're strong men. I just don't think that there are enough people in this country that are listening to them, to what they say. Imagine that. Mm. I had a thought, and it was to do with technology and the technology of off-Earth civilizations. I just I can't bring myself to say E.T. because it just... I think we need a new word because we need to acknowledge them. And the word E.T. is something that has been changed its meaning has changed over time and it doesn't give credence and respect and humility to other civilizations that just don't live on earth basically so off earth civilizations their technology we were talking about artificial intelligence about how it's the wrong route to go down what i'm curious to know is how does an off earth civilization develop to the technological state that they're in in order to have obviously craft that are technologically advanced in our way of looking at it without the use of artificial intelligence. Are you able to tell us or give us an inkling into what kind of technology and how it's developed? Nature has a way of protecting people from advancing beyond their realm. And the way that that is done here is that there are essentials that can't be produced on Earth that would get you beyond Earth. And that's a good thing. It's kind of like being in quarantine or, you know, earning something when you're ready for it. And, of course, it's become more and more evident to more and more people that the moon landing was a hoax. 
And when people get enough science under their belly, it's just ridiculous that it would have even been tried. But the fact that the people really wanted to believe it and that sterling people like JFK thought it was possible. And, of course, if he had known more about astrophysics, he would have known that it wasn't, and he would have been the first to admit it. Because he wanted transparency. He didn't want hoaxing. But, of course, hoaxing is a large part of the relationship between science and the military and has been since before World War I. And a second technology developed among industrialists, not the military, but industrialists right after the Civil War. The military got involved at a specific point, and that was basically over submarines. If you recall, the first submarines were constructed both by the Confederacy and by the Union in, during the, the Civil War. They didn't work very well, you know, but they were uh, capable of submerging and of surfacing. So what you're saying is that there are elements that would create a metal that would allow us to escape Earth's gravity, Earth's atmosphere, and survive the radiation of deep space in order to have deep space travel. And because there's, as you said, effectively under quarantine, those elements are not here. Now, is that deliberate to prevent us until we reach a certain stage of morality, a certain stage of development whereby we are no longer a threat not only to ourselves, everything on this planet, and obviously extended beyond this planet as well. No, you don't have the environment to produce that metal. Right. In fact, it was being produced by a series of operations that were visible from Earth. You remember a couple of years ago, there was what looked like a tornado in the corona of the sun that was going into the sun's surface. Mm -hmm. People thought that that was a craft. Actually, it was an operation to furnish that metal because the superstructure of planets is composed of that metal. But that metal, if put in a craft, can be ionized to protect the inhabitants of the craft and create the environment that they're used to, can be adjusted to do that and protect them from the G-force that is going to operate when the vehicle maneuvers. You can make those right-hand turns at high speeds and stuff, and it won't harm the people. All of this is only capable because that metal can be ionized, and that ionization prevents cosmic bombardment from penetrating the it doesn't even get to the shell of the vehicle. If you look at some of the metal that they have recovered from some of the craft, it's been discussed. I mean, I don't know that you'll find anybody can produce it because they are very careful about snatching it up. But you can talk to people that have seen it. They'll tell you it's like tinfoil, but it's so light because that ionization prevents the cosmic bombardment from even reaching it. So it has to conform to certain things in order to be able to be ionized. You can create an electric field around a number of different kinds of metals and compositions of metals, but not the ionization that's needed to do that. And it can only be produced under extremely high heat in the presence of a helium-hydrogen mixture or a series of operations that I won't discuss any further than I have. Mm -hmm. Not that it could be done here, uh, no. but attempts to do it would be disastrous. What level of technological advancement did previous lineages reach before they were extincted? Well, right. you had the blondes that actually became part of the extended community that have a base here and have a presence here and come among us. So you have them, but then you don't have any with split consciousness because up until I got involved deeply with humankind here, did anyone actually think that the split conscious could be civilized? That's a poor word. Inculturated beyond being able to be turned and twisted into being screwed up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I proven that's false in more ways than one 
And so now they take community, the extended community, pretty well agrees that it's very important to see if you guys can survive because you might offer something elegant, something new, something uh, that's been lacking. And, uh, of course, I mention more times than one. I mean, several times I've mentioned how important to the universe uh, finding new varieties of things to test them out to see they work because this is a process. Everything, you can say creation is a process. No one can go back to the very beginning. That's like seeing the face of God, and you're not allowed that. I mean, that's not going to happen. You know, awe has its purpose. And uh, you've often heard that old saying, it's true here, not necessarily true, though, with certain things, that familiarity breeds contempt. Well, sure enough, it does among people that have aspirations that exceed their ability to perform. They compensate. And one of the things that really offends them is someone that's different. And so that's where that comes from, I think. Nobody would ever say that off Earth. It'd be stupid. But on Earth, it's true, isn't it? It's kind of sad. It's very sad. Yeah. It's sad that it's true. (laughs) Well, yeah. Our ability to create music, art, um, is something that is looked at, I suppose you could say, as in awe, as something that needs to be introduced into the wider community in order that it can be encompassed by all. Well, people have a tendency to simplify something that they are not. They'll simplify it so it'll be easier for them to vilify or criticize. Even ETs do that. One of the things that clung to notions very strongly for so long was that the intensity of of humans here, of earthbound humans, uh, was looked upon as the reason for their violence, for their wars, for having a caste system, for having all the things that you won't find among an ET community. So they thought that that was an offshoot, that that was part of the barbarity that they saw going on here, and it's not. It comes from compensating for that barbarity, for recognizing it for what it was as far as they can and for finding something better. It's a thing of beauty, that intensity. And, of course, once that you get into their poetry and the music and drama, uh, all of the things that amount to art, it it makes it possible to reach an elegance that the ETs can't. Because they've been too comfortable for too long, (laughs) if you get my drift. Yeah, that's what I was just about to say, that the very fact that they've not had to strive to be intense has removed the ability to create intensity via art, via music, via everything else. So therefore, it's just something that's fallen by the wayside. Does that make sense? In my mind's eye, I can see that happening to our species, to humans, because A, it's happened before, and B, the only thing that's stopping us are those that are so interbred, so shallow, so psychopathic, so egotistical, and want to regain and retain control of everything for themselves. Okay, let's take time as a minuscule snapshot of time of where we all are now. It can't possibly continue the way that it is. It's, it, it's just not going to happen. So if you remove yourself from that time stamp and place yourself in, in a different, I don't know, use your creative imagination in order to envision a future like that. If reality is created by the mind, then surely we can get to that point or we will get to that point because I cannot see how it will not happen because there are too many people that are opening their eyes and saying, this is not right, this is what's happening here, these people are doing it and if we just get rid of them, then things are going to start getting better. It might not happen immediately, it might not happen in my lifetime, but it will certainly happen eventually. 
Well, the constraints of time only exist with people that keep time. Mm. They don't exist outside that, and the American Indian is an excellent example of it. Because they have a completely different attitude towards time, being on time. You can't hold them to schedules, because they don't believe in them. The Aborigine and all of these people have, in many cases, of course, they've had to learn to operate differently due to keeping a job or a fit in or whatever when they come among us. But among themselves, a guy goes home and the wife's not going to scream at him because he's late for dinner. No. That sort of thing. She's not. She's going to go warm the food up. It's not going to affect her attitude. She's not going to be upset. They have never been ruled by time. They're not going to start being ruled by time among themselves, you know, and they look upon us as foolish. They look upon us as slaves to time. We are. Yeah, and you don't have to be. What I'm trying to point out with respect to the subject is that if you aren't a slave to time, you are not limited by it. You know, that's a big secret that the serial universe is all about. Get out of your mind. Get out of that perception of racing with time, of trying to fit in with time, of being scheduled, etc., etc., and look at the canvas from a distance. Look at the perspective from a distance. Be a removed observer just for a while, long enough to see you don't need time. Yeah. Or let's say you don't need to be limited or to let anybody limit you to time. Now, we feel like it. We do. We do. But then... The bad thing about that is, I mean, we have to perform. We have to do things we don't necessarily like, but don't take them home. With your leisure time, be something else. Be something more. And Indians have acquired that ability to do. Not just the American Indian, but East Indians and people that follow the Hindu faith and the Buddhist faith, they have that ability. That's what meditation is all about, because they actually believe they're changing time. They're changing time dimensionally and in a way that they have control over their own time. Mm. So no matter how you go at it, find what suits you so that you are not one of these fanatic timekeepers when you go home. Free yourself where you can. From the and, restraints uh, of time. And, yeah, yeah, there are people that do that, and they prosper, and they're healthy and happy. They don't let the slavery extend beyond the job. They don't let the slavery extend beyond the pulpit. And you've got to look at it. If you serve it, you're a slave to it. And if you don't serve it, you're not a slave to it. I don't care how many chains they put on you or whatever. You have a mind, and that mind is precious, and they can't have it. They want to have it. They want to have you so wrapped up that when you retire, you go home and die. Because you're not needed anymore. They don't need you anymore. So go home and die and let somebody take your place that is youthful, that is more productive or whatever. This is a mindset they've been imposing all along. And when they came out with this health care, is universal health care and have that advisory death thing in it. I mean, how brazen was that? <laughs> well, basically, you know, we don't need you anymore. So the thing that they're suggesting, subliminal suggestion, is that we don't need you anymore, so die. Yeah, because you're no longer a productive slave to society. And the next step is if you don't have a job. And if there's no job, that doesn't make any difference to them. And the more people that buy into these mindsets that they want to put over, the less are going to fight them, the less are going to react, you know, and take any steps to change it. Yeah, that is plainly exampled with the homeless people, whereby buildings are putting spikes where they would sleep. Well, that is not the issue. The issue is the fact, why are these people homeless? Oh, and, of course. And how can, yeah, how can you possibly prevent someone from... Passing city ordinances that criminalize feeding them. Yeah. Taking away areas where they can rest their head. Shipping them off because they're inconvenient for a tourist business like they do in Hawaii. And disappearing them. 
Who knows what that is? Who knows where they're disappearing them to or what they're doing with them once they do? But well, I know in Fort Worth, where I live, that they've almost vanished. It used to be some low-rent housing where they could live and get by. That's all gone. And they build a water garden. Big deal. Okay. What's interesting about that water garden is that one winter a few years ago, a family of two or three kids and a man and his wife walked down. Now, this is a water garden. They walked down to where this fountain is bubbling. It's like a whirlpool. It's deep. And one of them fell in it. And in trying to, because it's iced over, one of them is trying to get the other one out. They fell in it. And before it was over, there were two people that drowned. You know, quite an irony. You know, more than an irony. I think one of the things that's happening is that humanity and compassion are being tested. You've talked about people being pulled, and that is definitely part of it. And you see it happening over and over again. If you use social network in any way, if you use it every day, you can see the way a meme gets run by. The way they push things, there's social experiments where they'll go out and film somebody pretending to be homeless and how people react and that kind of thing. And you can see the outrage when they talk about it's illegal to feed the homeless. People will find it hard to believe that that's going on in America and it's happening here now. They're going to make it harder and harder to actually help the people who are vulnerable. While at the same time, they push a level of racism against the Muslims. That's happening here against the so-called migrants, they call them, when they're actual refugees, these people. These people are on the run because they've got nowhere to go. All these things come up to that same point where what it is to be human. So on the one hand, we're not even told our true history. And on the other, they're trying to shape us into being this, like them, being a psychopath almost towards each other. Yeah. So that this lack of humanity is bred into each generation, not necessarily using biological weaponry, but using the mind. It's all about, you know, what I was trying to say earlier about if people knew what their true potential was, I wonder just how much they would accept what's happening to them over and over again and how much, why don't they push in question? I mean, I find it absolutely mind-blowing that I'm living at a time when a sea, an entire ocean is dying as a result, partly a direct result of the radiation from Fukushima. Not all of it is that. It was already in trouble, but Fukushima is doing that to an ocean, plus it's doing a great deal to the atmosphere. Well, it was recoverable before Fukushima. It isn't now. No. And it would take off Earth technology to salvage this planet because it's just gone too far. What you know is one thing, but what you don't know about is much worse. Mm -hmm. So uh, if what you do know leads to understanding that what you do know is extinction level, mm -hmm. imagine what you don't know. And on top of that, the industry which benefits the most from the military's obsession with weaponizing everything they touch has too much influence with Congress, has too much influence with different agencies of the government. And so, in many ways, it has run rampant. And when you take in consideration the outcome, the military has an accounting office that hasn't been accounting. There was an investigation launched trying to find out where $16 trillion. Do you know how much $16 trillion is? I don't even think it's yeah. a logical number, to be honest. Well, you know what a million is. You know what a billion is. Next comes a trillion. It's a thousand billion. That's, That's how much a trillion is. A thousand billion. <laughs> If I lost 50 quid, I'd be desperate, <laughs> let alone 17 trillion. I mean, what kind of a figure is that for goodness well, sake? Well, call up the IMF and have them print you a sheet of $100 bills. Would that exactly. be okay? Yeah, of course, that, by that the time you get it, you might be able to buy a candy bar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope I'm kidding. I hope I'm kidding. You know, I wrote on my wall that if they want to turn this around, they could do it. That's what I don't, don't understand. Why are they letting it go as far as they're letting it go? 
I just cannot wrap my head around that because it is going to get so much worse. Married, it'll send people into the streets and then they'll start taking what they have to have to survive. And when they do, then they will be treated like criminals and there will be an outbreak, one outbreak after another. And then they'll declare martial law, which is the only way that a monster like Stalin want to be is going to be able to survive because when they find out when the next president comes in and he's not one of them, he's going to find one criminal act, one treasonable act, one, you know, (laughs) Obama's days are numbered. Yeah, but is that even feasible that another president would come in that isn't one of them? Oh, yeah. Really? It's no, happened no. before. Look, we've had all kinds of people complain about some of the presidents that we've had and vilify them and everything because they think that if they're in the Democrat Party, then they'll do that with an historical Republican who was an honest and good man that was president because he was on the wrong side because that's what they think. They're agenda driven. When in truth, that president may have done everything that he could to affect meaningful change. And try to bring about consumer protection. Theodore Roosevelt, excellent example of what I'm talking about. He had his foibles, and he wasn't an angel, but he was a good and honest man. And you can say some things about the Kennedys. You can say, oh, they were womanizers. Well, JFK wasn't a womanizer. His back wouldn't let him be. You can say that about Robert Kennedy. He probably was a womanizer. But... (laughs) Compared to what we have today, he was a pretty decent attorney general. He started an anti-organized crime unit that Reagan couldn't wait to get rid of, and he was making a difference. But then he wasn't an angel. The people that don't like the Democrats can come in and they can talk about JFK like they know what they're talking about, and they're not. And they can talk about... Robert Kennedy, like they know what they're talking about, and they may, because he probably did some things he shouldn't have done. But he was not a traitor to this country. Now, we haven't had a person loyal to this country in the office for two decades, two and a half decades. And, you know, we have traitors. That's what they are. They're traitors. Clinton's made the worst trade deals for this country. They sold out the Panama Canal. They sold out, you know, the Chinese are giving them millions of dollars for their campaign contributions to get favored nations trading clause. And whenever the Panamanians wanted to continue get a new lease so that our base would stay there, that we would protect them like we had before. And the Clintons said no. So now China managed to get the front lock and the back lock at the Panama Canal and essentially control it. If there was ever a war, we would have a lot of problems getting from one ocean to the next quickly. You see how that works? Yeah. Well, when you actually go through it, if the Chinese were really bad people, they could have bought this country from the Clintons. (laughs) Literally. And, of course, one of the thoughts behind the Chinese getting so many dollars, American dollars, was that we saturated with all these dollars. They'd go along with anything that we wanted to do that would affect the dollar because they want to protect that value of that dollar, right? It didn't work out that way. (laughs) They were the first to print a currency backed by gold which is just like sticking a pin into a balloon. (laughs) Well, obviously, because, you know, if a currency is backed by gold, then it has real value. Whereas, like we said earlier on, this figure of $17 trillion, is that backed by gold? No, it is not. It's not. We are printing fiat currency. Mm. And if you look on the dollar bill today, it's Federal Reserve note. And it's not backed by anything. You know, we did have silver certificates. We did have gold bonds. We did have gold certificates at one time. In fact, William Jennings Bryant stood up before Congress, and when we went off the gold standard and went to the silver standard, his famous, I will not be crucified on a cross of silver speech. 
<laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> he was absolutely right. But remember when Perot said, well, if you pass this treaty, if you pass NAF, if you pass it, then you're going to hear a sucking sound of all those jobs going south. And we laughed at his ears. You remember? He spoke the absolute truth. He didn't speak it for himself because he made a ton of money when it was passed with Alliance. He owns that airport. No, he made a ton of money, but he cared about America. And so he told the truth. And we laughed at his ears. You remember? Not personally. You know, I can see where you're coming from when you're saying this. And we are all slaves to money. Yeah, so look at Trump. Trump is saying things that should have been said by Ron Paul, that should have been said by any and everybody that is wise to the problems of this country. And we're laughing at him because he's a billionaire. I'm not laughing at him. He's got a bloody great golf course in Scotland. He's not like Jim Scotland. Sorry, don't like him. Oh, I know, I know. Look, he's a billionaire. You've got to expect anybody that keeps on making money to that extent has got something loose in the head. But not just his two at the same time, he cares about this country. Mm. He's not a traitor. We'll see. You so have to appreciate what good a person is. When you're in trouble and you're fighting and you're trying to survive, you've got to appreciate anybody that understands your plight enough to care. And Trump does a lot more than anybody else in Congress. Mm. There might be people that do, but they don't dare represent it. Well, this guy does because he doesn't care about where his campaign funds come from, right? So maybe that's what it takes. I don't know, but I just know this, that I like what he says better than what all these other creeps are not saying. Mm -hmm. I, of course, you know, I'm sure I wouldn't agree with his politics, and I don't agree with his values, but he's not a traitor. So let's have a bit of a projection then as to where you think or you feel or sense things might go, let's say, by the end of the year. Well, I know that even among the backers that Stalin wannabe has, he's gone off the rails. I know that. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with this. China and Russia have not played ball with the intents of the globalists, and they're a big factor. The fact that to the rest of the world, maybe not the United States, but the rest of the world, that what Obama has done is vindictive in the Ukraine, in Syria, it's vindictive because people have been murdered in mass. Airplanes have been shot down, murdered. The only people that would have any reason to do that were not the Russians. They were the Ukrainians trying to blame it on the Russians. We don't know why the pilot of one airplane flew over an area he wasn't supposed to fly over, but that's no reason to shoot the plane down, and the Russians didn't think so either. Besides the fact, the Russians have pretty well proven that they weren't involved, but it hasn't reached the United States. There are people that just take for granted that the Russians shot it down. People that take for granted that the Russians invaded Crimea and took it, and they didn't. They were asked to come in because of the monsters in the Ukraine, in Kiev, that were massacring people. And they didn't want to be next because they were Russian-speaking instead of Ukrainian. There's not that much difference between the languages, really. But there's a difference in the ethnicity between the right wing, the fundamentalist right wing in northern Ukraine and Muscovite Russians. There's an extraordinary amount of Ukrainian refugees in the UK. There's an extraordinary amount of them in Russia. There's an extraordinary amount of refugees <laughs> full stop all over the world. Yeah, because the only reason what is going on in those parts is not going on here is because the citizens of the United States have kept their guns. Yeah, but that doesn't and stand the only true reason, for today, and, does it? Yeah, well, the minute that it happens here, I mean, the, the shit hits a fan here, it'll happen in England. You know, all of this 
will go together. So people don't have time to sit back and draw any comparisons. You know, you do it here, you do it there, you keep everyone embroiled and stirred up so they won't be able to work out what the next best step is to survive, to fight back, to whatever. And that's how it would be done. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be done because I'm hoping it won't. But I'm saying that that's how it would be done. If it's going to be done, that's how it'd be done. You've been advocating and advising for, well, as long as I've known you, so a good few years now, to be putting away stores of food, of water, of, you know, things that you would need should these items suddenly become unavailable. Do you foresee with the latest global market crash, and I'm going to call it that because it's plainly not just an American stock market crash, that this would be a good time for people to maybe start considering buying an extra can of beans or, you know, just maybe stocking up on a few essentials. Do you think it will get to that? Any student of history, real student of history, will tell you that's unavoidable. Okay. Uh, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's food, water, whatever we're talking about, We'll tell you that the efficiency of supply and demand is based on profit. Yeah. If the dollar crashes, where's the profit in supplying that availability? There is. Do you know how Allende was overthrown in Chile? No, but please do enlighten me. The CIA paid truck drivers not to deliver any food to the cities. Yep. That's how it happened. And, of course, in all the turmoil, then the CIA moved in and killed Allende and killed Sheikh Guevara and anybody associated with them and put a military coup in place. This was all over. Allende was going to nationalize Anaconda Copper. So it's what's happening at the moment. The timing is interesting because you have a couple of explosions in China, which I think were a warning shot. And uh, then you, know, you have Jade don't. Helm already in place. You've got your military where you want them, supposedly, unless they turn around and say, fuck you, we're not going to do with, what you tell us. A, they have to have a lot more assets than the 4,000 troops would yeah. need. Yeah. So if it all goes down, everything's in place. So you think, I would like to think that there's a quiet rebellion, underground stuff going on. And that's another reason the UN are starting forest fires, as we talked about earlier. So there's a lot of things in place, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get away with what they want to get away with. I mean, mm -hmm. people are not as stupid and as, as much sheeple as others would like them to be. And you mean it's the media would portray it? The media know, and yeah. also the truth movement. You know, people get pushed around with memes all the time, with all this bullshit, and they get called sheeple often enough, but they're not believing it. They try to create division in the ranks, so to speak. They try to undermine people within certain movements, and you, you can't separate them off like that. It's like in the anti-geoengineering group, they'll not listen to people talking about Fukushima. You see what I mean? They'll start to oh, go yeah. into this whole thing of, oh, no, but, you know, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this. But it's going to get to a point, and that point is getting closer every single day where that is not going to matter. It's literally not going to matter because they're going to have to get up there and start educating others very, very quickly how to survive what's happening. Well, when you do something so destabilizing to the crust of the earth as allow those cores to hit the mantle, mm -hmm. along with fracking, along with creating these great caverns, which are causing all of these cave-ins, which are causing all of these sinkholes and so forth, Mm -hmm. because after they extract the oil, which has a specific viscosity, and they pump in salt water, it doesn't have the same viscosity, so it leaves the crust more and more unstable. Picture this. They have taken, because they think they're in a salt dome or because they think that they're in a granite basalt host rock or whatever, you know, it's going to be stable or whatever. Yeah, but they are networking all over the place and to connect Denver with Virginia and Washington, D.C. and all this underground and everything and run their magnetic subway line and all this, they have to have stability more uniformly throughout of the crust. And they destroyed that. They cannot survive very long in the wake of any kind of nuclear exchange now. Mm. I mean, it'll be like, you know, you stack up dominoes, 
Yeah. Maybe a thousand dominoes. You stack them up and you push one little over and plink, all of them go. They have created a nightmare. And then they move in CERN to even stir things up more. And they plant these stories about what they could do, what it might do, and all this, and all fear tactics, all kinds of crap. You know, oh, we're going to bring in a host of demons from Hades <laughs> or from Cthulhu. You know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, put Shiva out front, <laughs> the destroyer of worlds. <laughs> oh, man, what the hell? The, you know, where do you get these myth-making stupidities? I mean, it's like... Reminds me of what Genghis Khan said whenever the Caliph of Baghdad tried to get him to launch a counter crusade against the Europeans. And he sent his envoy back to tell the Caliph, no, this is not what sane men do. And the same is true here. None of this is what sane men do. Mm -hmm. We have sanity and then we have insanity. And the leadership in this country has not been led by sanity in a long, long time. And it has gotten so far out of hand because if you have a social engineer or you have a team of sociologists and political science men and you put them together and they can't come up with a better plan than this, then it's because they're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. And that's what the situation is. It's so much like the medical community in the AMA. There are doctors that have medical degrees that wouldn't be able to use their medical degree, wouldn't be able to hold on to their permit to practice medicine, so to speak, their credentials, whatever, if they were truthful. And they might not even be able to hold on to their life, as evidenced by these nine at last count physicians in Florida that have either been suicided or murdered. And that's because they're the only thing that stands against rational thinking is the Obamacare fiasco. I think there is an even more incredible explanation for why they were picked. I think too many of them were trading retirees down there that have more money than God. And their little yuppie sons that are brokers on Wall Street want to get that money. And they get inside information so that they can take advantage of when mommy and daddy are put away. And they can't do that. They can't operate as close to the line as they would like if mommy and daddy are getting too good a health care. You follow me? Yeah. Why do I say that? I did a show on Veritas. And in that show, we talked about the possibility of the Gulf of Mexico fiasco by BP being used as a false flag. And it became evident to me that it was going to be when they discovered all these U.N. vans on this airfield just south of Fort Lauderdale, thousands of them, and you could see them on Earthlink. And when they started spraying the Corexit on the Atlantic side of Florida, in the Atlantic Ocean, and, of course, the breeze was carrying it into these people, and they were elderly anyway, <laughs> If it had kept up, if they kept doing it, then, of course, they're going to have to go out, pick these people up, and take them somewhere. Why not a FEMA camp? U.N. vehicles, really. These were U.N. vehicles that were parked out there on those airstrips. Thousands of them. But are they not just in preparation for, you know, what's coming down the pipe, obviously, or what's planned to be There's always the a profit motive. Yeah, Remember... Absolutely. Remember, I talk about trilateralism. I talk about the tri trilateralists. They have made the triage idea of the triad or whatever, the triangle, the three points, you know, all this, this works into everything they do. They always have three purposes, three levels to each purpose, and three contingencies for everything they do. They at 911, they had three. What were the three? Make money for the people that they had to use to do it, the Zionists. They let them have that gold. They let Silverstein make his $4 billion, and they all did what they wanted. Then the regime, the Bush regime, had its way to enrich themselves with that war in Iraq. Think about how much money Cheney made off of that. I don't even want to go there. 
not just because you know, <laughs> the rest of us have to suffer without. That's right. I'll tell you, with the money that they bailed out, those financial lending institutions, mostly in New York, with that big bailout, they could have paid off all the debt of every American and then had thousands of dollars left over to give each one. You realize that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in turn, they could turn around, pay off their debts. That would have made all those lending institutions well if they weren't siphoning off money, converting it to gold. And sending it to Israel. Yeah, I worked years ago for a very wealthy Jewish man who told me he'd be even more wealthy if he didn't send a great deal of his wealth out to Israel. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, account for every single yeah. Jewish person. They might have been doing it in good faith. Yeah, they want to believe that that's the case. But, of course, any of them that are in the know, either in finance or entertainment, they know better. They just are fearful. There are a lot of people that are Jewish who don't go along with this. The Hasidic Jews don't believe that Israel should have a homeland. Mm -hmm. And they are very appreciative of the people that run Iran because they have religious tolerance there. And they have a number of Jews in Iran. And they treat them well. Iran is far more tolerant, a hundred times more tolerant, of other religions and other people and other ways of doing things than Saudi Arabia, who we're in bed with. And there's a documentary on why we are in bed with them. And it has to do with the secret arrangement FDR made way back with the Shah of Iran, not Shah of Iran, but with the royal family of Saudi Arabia, that if we protected them and we left their religion alone, which is extreme, more extreme than any other fundamentalist Muslim religion. Damn right. As long as we did that, then they would sell all their oil to us and accept only dollars. And then they were able to move that in further to create OPEC and give all the member nations of OPEC the same guarantees if they would only accept American dollars for their oil. So everybody that had to buy oil from them had to first get the American dollar. So that propped up the American dollar after the jobs, the patents, everything was sold out and gone overseas for cheap labor, you know, which never should have happened. And when Obama came in in office and he was being interviewed, this is in the first uh, month or two of his first administration, and he was being asked by a reporter, you know, well, I guess this means you're going to bring jobs back and business and factories and so forth. And he says, oh, no, I have to honor those foreign treaties. Then I knew we'd been sold a bill of goods. Nobody else caught on, though. Nobody else caught on. They were still hoping and wishing, you know, there would be change. Yeah, things got a lot worse. A lot worse. Of course, when he got his second administration, I never will believe that he did it honestly. I believe that that was fixed, just like what happened in Florida with those voting machines, where Gore got a negative amount. <laughs> and then it said to Mosian, this lady who started to drive to investigate those machines, and she went to Congress with proof that they could be hacked the smart cards in them could be hacked. And so she showed, and of course, Diebolt, whose machines they were, came out and said, oh, we're sorry, we're so sorry, and everything, uh, we'll fix it. I <laughs> uh, would trust them 10 feet. Myra, have you got any other questions or things that are sort of like in the front of your head that are relevant to us doing this chat with James tonight? Because things are plainly happening around the world and a little bit faster than they have been recently. Yeah, I'd like to ask why, and it's probably untrue, but why are the scientists saying that the sun is really quiet just now when it should be doing things that it normally does at the moment? They can't it, but... predict anything about the sun. Mm. I know that, but they're pushing this whole, the sun's really quiet, we're going to go into an ice age. If you look at the predictions, you know, these are supposed to be astrophysicists doing mm -hmm. this. And if you go from one or the other, they're all saying different things. We have been on the verge of the next ice age now for the last 300 years. And there have been indications here and there have been indications there. But, of course, that interferes with selling 
global warming, doesn't it? And, of course, global warming gives the government more and more control over everybody, not just business or industry or whatever, us, all of us. And they can turn and twist that control any way they want to. They can make you a villain because your backyard caught fire. They can make you, you know, in exact any penalty they want. And then justify that to a bunch of people that are so expressly politically correct that anything that is worded just right, they'll buy. And we have politically correct people, if you haven't noticed, that are just like that. They are drooling morons that are so agenda-driven that anything that's properly worded, no matter how far-fetched, they'll buy lock, stock, and barrel. You have people that are misdirected because they're agenda-driven that will do anything to further that agenda. That's what's wrong with the Democrat Party. Democrat Party is backing a monster because he's a Democrat. The Democrat Party is ready to back a new monster that has proven that she's incapable of being any kind of an executive under any condition, that is so corrupt and has been from the very start of her career, she has a criminal record. It's just that it was never prosecuted. So that brings us back again to... Yeah, she was caught lying before a grand jury as a lawyer. She should have been disbarred and she should have served time. And her bosses made the charges against her. So plainly, we just need to get rid of them all. But I'm not even entirely sure if humanity would actually have the balls to stand up and say, you, out, you, out, you, jail, you, well and truly. Well, there are people that are trying. They have given us all the ammunition that we need, really. I mean, look in England there. There is hardly any element of the government that isn't involved in pedophilia in England. Oh, God. That is a whole subject in itself. It really is. That's a whole three-hour conversation. When you have a scandal like that, and it goes so high and so thoroughly within the fabric of both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, you have a right to call a new government. And that's what you should be doing. You know, I don't know why people aren't getting together and doing that, because you will have a lot of politicos drooling at the chops to do it. Because any time that there is a major turnover in any kind of government, the people that might be able to take advantage of that, uh, hell, they're waiting in the eaves. And, of course, you would have that. You would have plenty of support for it. And probably somebody would find a way to implicate the throne in that. Because, you see, Elizabeth has never accounted for those indigenous children in Canada that disappeared. You know, Canada is like Australia in having a government that is so enamored of the throne that they'll eat the queen's shit. Pardon the expression. Well, I mean, you would have thought that when the information came out about Diana's death that people would have then questioned. I think they did. Look look how that was confused. Look how they tried to blame the driver. Even recently, when some things came out, they tried to involve him. He was involved with MI6. He was this, he was that. Well, no. He had to be accountable to MI6 the same way that people had to be accountable to security on the Kennedys. That was their job. Yeah, but the point I'm trying to make is is that there's these crisis points that happen in history and patterns that repeat and things that come up where you think, for example, just after 9-11 or just around a time when the Diana documentary that is going around, I've forgotten the name of it, but you can watch it online, which basically was about the trial, you know, the investigation into her death. I thought, well, this will maybe trigger some stuff. I thought when the truth came out about Jimmy Savile, that might trigger some stuff. But there's something about this country, the whole of the United Kingdom, where uh, we're just completely suppressed as a people and apathetic, but completely suppressed or in fear. And maybe it's because we don't have any guns. I don't know. Nothing's there should be happening. a revolution, but it's not happening. Yeah. There's all this evidence. I mean, Cameron is it. worse than Thatcher, and that's saying oh, something. Oh, Cameron is ten times worse than Blair. Oh, Absolutely. You know he's a Zionist, don't you? Well, it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Where he is, yeah. 
But what is going on in the systematic dismantling of the welfare state? And so, therefore, he's targeting the ill, the mentally ill, the disabled, the extremely vulnerable. You know, people say, oh, it's just like (laughs) Nazi Germany. I don't know. I didn't live through that. I can't compare. But I'm assuming if what I read was true, then it's very similar. But it's just unbelievable to watch it unfold and get worse and worse. And people really hate him. But they're not taking action on that. I mean, it's, it's difficult. I know it's difficult because to step up to that plate is not an easy thing. But it just surprises me that there is not more vocalism about it, even within the comedians. You know, we used to have brilliant satire in this country. We don't seem to have that. We have a bunch of morons, as far as I'm concerned. The think same funny. is true here. I mean, every once in a while, somebody will say something like Carlin. But, yeah, of course, uh, mm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're suicided, you know, or they have an accident, or all of a sudden they die of some interminable cancer or something. And I think, Myra, the answer to why is that's because. Because I watched The Internet's Own Boy the other night, and I was just... It's been out for ages, but I just managed to get to see it. And I just thought, you know, you're either suicided or you're pressured to suicide or you're destroyed or or this, that and the other. And I think this is the issue because they're such dirty, underhanded tactics to anybody that would want to speak out and correct these wrongs. This is what you have to expect if you go into the water. Yeah. I do. I expect it. I've had strange things happen. But, you know, at the same time, I have the luxury of knowing where I'm going after it's all over. And that makes it rather polemical to me. But to earthbounds, you know, there can't be sure. You know, even you guys who trust me and we have grown together closely, you don't know for sure. You don't know for sure about the MVs being chambers for souls you don't know that for sure you will but you have forgotten me you'll see me out there and you'll think i'm a doorman <laughs> no i won't because we've oh, got you will do you will do you will do <laughs> said with such conviction that it's hard not to believe it but i where know we are, yeah where I we know. are now it's kind of hard to believe that we wouldn't i've had people that are very dear to me go in the chambers and uh, you know I look in I have my nose right up there it's the crystal and they looking out at me I guess I can't be sure because you know you're in an ephemeral state you look like when you move or you travel you're light and you can assume a form to it if you want But you're ephemeral, and you draw on everything that uh, anybody in there has. It's a wonderful thing. I know that it is. Every once in a while, somebody will come out, and they brush by me very quickly. And they have something in mind to do, I guess. I don't know. I asked you a question a couple of months ago about the souls within the EMVs being able to or being part of the decision as to where the EMVs go. So there's a synergistic communion or community and communion. No, they don't do that, but I guess they could if if that was the direction they wanted. I mean, there wouldn't be any reason against it because their knowledge they have to offer is as pure as anyone's. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering how, you know, you're going into the chambers, but you're still having a life so to speak i mean you're still oh yeah i can feel it i can feel the energy i can feel it's it is like uh have you ever been cold and then stuck your butt up to a fire or the stove i live in scotland for god's sake (laughs) (laughs) well that's what it's like sweetheart that's what it's like it is like that's why i'm looking forward to going i tell you yeah that's what it's like (laughs) But yeah, 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 I mean, that's it. That's part of it. But I just wondered if they had some way of, I mean, it's, uh, I'm trying to sort of imagine it in my head, but I can never get the words to describe it. What I tap into or try and tap into is a flow of energy and movement between the souls inside the chambers and what the EMVs are doing. You know, there's kind of a combination of things going on at the same time. It's like being part of the greater universe. When you're a soul within that chamber, you're part of what is 
creating and maintaining the universe? Or are you just kind of a soul in a chamber having a, a blissful time? And part of the creativeness. That's the best way I can describe it. Because to say one thing about it is like saying this is it and it's so much more. I mean, they're yeah. an integral part of the universe, an integral part of the creation or the creativeness of the universe. I think that they are a large part of the mind of God. But, you know, there's so many. There's so many EMVs throughout the universe, countless number. And, of course, there's souls in them. This, what you've just said leads me nicely onto a question that I've had on the tip of my tongue while I've been listening to you two talk and I've been trying to develop it. So if when we die, we go into the chambers and we become souls or we are souls and we go into the chamber and do whatever it is that they do. Well, your mind and soul comes together to form spirit. And then you go to a star eventually because you'll get cold. And they, you'll draw that energy from that star. And probably it'll have EMVs. It may not because that system may not have sentient life yet or be in a process of some dynamic occurrence or event. But generally, if you decide to go into the sun, definitely there will be EMVs and you'll eventually be drawn to one. And you're not compelled, but drawn. And when you go inside, you will go into a chamber because that's what you'll be drawn to. It's not a compulsion. It's not a demand, but it's nature. And uh, then you may come out sometime or another. You're not a prisoner. And I've had people, well, you make it sound like that or you make it sound like this, and I don't mean to. But it's all a wonderful thing. I mean... It is so much more than the fundamentalist Christian's idea of heaven. So much more. Because it's so deep. It's so uh, so giving of everything. I mean, you have everything that you could possibly want. And uh, there's no holding back anything. It's all just... It's like I think of it as being a particle of water going down a waterfall. That's what I think of it as. If you've ever seen how beautiful that is, I mean, yeah. it's just elegant. And that's how you must feel. Uh, and I think maybe in some way that it is part of the mind of God. I don't see how it could be not, to tell you the truth, because it is a mystery to me. I want it to remain a mystery. I want to always have that awe that attaches to something being so magnificent and so removed from everything else that it's a mystery. Because that conjures, not that's the wrong word, that is what creates the awe that keeps us in our place. Willingly, lovingly. You know, a child has that kind of regard for their parents. And that's what we should have for whoever's in charge of all this. So where do new souls come from then? If, say like when each of us dies, we do exactly what you've just said and we become souls and we go into the chambers because we're drawn to, because we want to. How are new souls created? Well, it's just a term that people who want to believe a certain thing or who have a reason to want to look at it a certain way say... I don't think it has much meaning in reality, but there are beliefs, and there's nothing wrong with them, that the soul life is 144 years. It may take that long, and it may take extra lives for you to perfect your soul so that it is in harmony or at the right frequency to unite with the mind and all that. I mean, they have their different ideas, and some of them are kind of interesting, but... Really, I don't think it's as complicated as that, and I don't think that it's really true. But people believe it's true and might be. People can move mountains with belief. So what about the idea of a soul that chooses its family because it's familiar territory or they've had past well, that, lives that's, together? That's spiritual technology, and I differentiate between that and the spirit. 
because that's when a whole planetary culture figure out that they can place their consciousness in something besides a body. And they figure out a way to do that. And once they do that, they think about, well, do we want to die as individuals or do we want to achieve this spiritual technology and stay together? And sometimes they do, you know. The people that helped you when you were on Mars, the Druze, they did. The people that created the EBs, the Abroit, they did. And uh, down through what I know of the deep past, I would say there's maybe one in 50 cultures, planetary cultures, that do that. It takes a very high level of technology to achieve, but there are cultures in the extended community that have that technology if they chose, but they don't. They believe in the system I'm talking about. But whenever I go into a star to warm up to go into an EMV, I sometimes see people in that star that might be the product of spiritual technology. But they have nothing to do with me, and I don't pry. We were talking the other day about the Egyptians. They had a form of spiritual technology, yeah? They were familiar with it, and they believed that they could prepare for it, and that was what the House of the Dead was for. But they couldn't get it out of their heads that the carnal existence was an anchor to the spiritual world, and it isn't. But they believed it was, and they thought cats were the servants of the soul and that they would be used for transport. So they believed that the cat had something special. They had something like a, a spiritual communication, a spiritual vehicle for the soul. Mm -hmm. And so when they would die, this kind of thing became bizarre after a while. By the third dynasty, it started changing. And of course, the priests, whatever priest caste was in charge of the house of the dead, was the premier priest caste in Egypt. And what they would do is they would make shekels, money, <laughs> by selling cats. And the oh. more cats you had, you know, when you would die, when you were going to die, you'd leave behind some money to buy a bunch of cats. And the more cats that were buried with you or entombed with you, the more likely you would find a successful match for you to help transport your soul. <laughs> oh, I'll be I, I, so, I'm sorted then. I'm not worried about that then. <laughs> they sometimes find 50, 60 cats in a tomb. It remains the cats that they entombed them with. So the cats would have been killed then when they died? Oh. Uh, they didn't kill them in the tomb, but after they seal the tomb, the cat can't get water, can't get food. Oh. Of course, that's one of the reasons why they would put the carps in the sarcophagus, because that would protect the, the, um, the carps. From, yeah. yeah. That's upset me now. I love my cats. <laughs> so, with, so basically, it's almost like a race gets to a point where... Well, in the Egyptians' case, they kind of have it. You know, they get close to this level of spiritual knowledge and spiritual technology, and then it becomes distorted, is what I'm trying to say. You see, the Egyptians, when Egypt actually became uh, the Egypt that you know and talk about today, was when the Upper and Lower Nile became united under one kingdom. At that time, there was a dynasty of ETs, and these were people that had crashed, and they had tried to survive in the Grand Canyon, and that was problematic. So they moved, and they moved to Egypt. And when they got to Egypt, of course, there were all kinds of conflicts, uh, tribal competition and so forth, and they started uniting people, and they built up a few cities. These were monument cities, and after they were built, they attracted more and more people to them, and that's when they began to conquer those they didn't attract. And once they had conquered enough to build more cities, they began trading, and they established trade routes to Africa, all the way down to South Africa, and what is South Africa today, and also up into Mesopotamia, what well, it was Mesopotamia then, and Persia. And they built war chariots. Of course, this was Bronze Age. 
the first people to have iron were the Hittites. They were black. If the First Dynasty were a race of off-earth humans that crash-landed here and tried to no, settle... No, they were ETs. But there was no way for them to leave, so therefore they thought, well, you know, we've got to make the best of a bad situation here. There was a way for them to leave but not survive. In what they way? They crashed here. They crashed here, and of course they could have left, but they wouldn't have survived because they didn't have the metal. Didn't have enough of it after they crashed. Right, got you, because there's a certain specific metal that will protect them out yeah. in deep space. Right, okay, that makes sense. So the bizarreness of the Egyptian images that we see and their language, is that based on an ET language? No, that's based by the farmer extinction. The Etruscans were the connection to the Egyptian tradition and the extinction before this, before this lineage. The uh, Egyptians, of course, learned through the Etruscans, the, I will say, the leadership of the Egyptians, the Pharaoh caste, uh, learned about the former extinctions from the Etruscans. Right. Uh, of course, a lot of their symbolism and a lot of their meanings weren't a cult. They were actually practices that had been achieved by this priest caste that existed in the former extinction, a former lineage. And they had preserved some of the things that later became identified with the Egyptians as Egyptian magic. And, uh, it was actually from the Etruscan from the previous era. Well, they knew if you had a certain form at a certain time and said certain words, they were the words of power. When Akhenaten took the people who later became the Hebrew nation, when he took them with him when he left Egypt, you know, they call him Moses. And when he left Egypt, he was conforming to the belief of the words of power in speaking to God and in calling upon the host. The, the, each of the elements was controlled by a particular angel. And so Solomon was given the way to summon the host. You know, the host that was fire, earth, water, yeah. and air. Yeah. Amulets and whatever were made in the book of Solomon, they're given. But this is what Moses or Akhenaten was given when he was on the mount conversing with God. But, of course, he had the words of power. And this was given to him because he was a pharaoh. He was also a magician. And uh, he knew them. And he knew how to contact God. I mean, this is all story. Mm. But this is the truest part of the story. Not what the Zionists have made out of it or false prophets that have tried to establish themselves today. But the reality may be quite different. You know, this is the myth that's made out of it. And, of course, there's the true myth and then there's the bullshit that has been made out of it. I always thought Isis was associated with the words of power. Is that wrong? Was she not getting anything to do with it at all? Well, uh, it's become a handed down belief among sex, religious mm. sex. You know, God is supposed to have a name. Mm. And if you say that name correctly, you summon him, supposedly. It's mm. not true. I would have been able to summon him myself, right? Mm. <laughs> I can't summon. But no, uh, that is not true. But of course, religious people who are myth driven are going to buy into it. I mean, you've got a lot of them today. You've got a lot of people, and some of this woo-woo is really ridiculous, but, I mean, doesn't keep people from believing it. And you say anything to them, and they just write you off. What about the power of intention in the mind? I mean, they had an understanding of that as well. It's upon the commitment. I have a phrase for that, which I teach in Unified Consciousness. Which is? Moral core. Oh, cool. Yeah. So these words of power that were learned from the Etruscan who were from a previous lineage to ours. It depends on what you're trying to do. There is not an incantation for just everything that, you know, precise 
words of power for achieving certain things. It's a way of praying without... Bringing religious elements into it. Yeah, or without certain form. It's along lines of a certain belief, too, but not a rigid belief. I was curious because we were talking about the Etruscans. They knew these words of power because they had obviously got to a higher stage of from wherever we are now because, let's face it, we seem to be devolving at the moment. Well, I would like to go to the Etruscan room in Cambridge Mm. because there's certain things in there that, you know, like I say, trigger back thoughts, make them real, like when you experience them when you had those experiences that caused those thoughts. And, of course, that's what I would have because the Etruscans, when they were a civilization, let's say, and they never really were, what they were, they were a very unique group of, I would say, a culture of adepts. They were known as priests. They were known as learned men, sages, and whatever. And the Romans consulted with them quite often and considered them very gifted. And they were someone to interpret a dream, someone to read the bones with and uh, all that. And, uh, of course, they didn't play to that. The Etruscans were very sensual and spent a lot of time on the couch with their lovers. (laughs) You know, just petting each other, but engaging in a very erudite conversation, too. And they, you know, if they liked you, they wanted to pet you, too. I mean, they were very interesting people. But, uh, yeah, they were something else. But how did they survive the previous, okay, um, they're a role, they're survivors of the previous era. Is there a line? Where are the previous survivors of the previous era? Are there other survivors of the previous era? Blondes. There's some people in cavities in the earth, too. You probably wouldn't recognize them, though. There were two children that came out of a cave in France about the late 1700s. They were green. They had green skin, boy and a girl. The villagers tried to get them home when they found out they weren't doing well. The sun was not easy on them. So they tried to find out where they come from so they could return them for their health. They could never do that, and they eventually died. But that's an old story, and it's probably true. I know that it's true. Uh, There's an element of truth. Yeah, it was even in Fate magazine. It was a story in Fate magazine, too. And there are a lot of good stories in Fate magazine that I checked out. So the Etruscans survived... An extinction, is that what you're saying? I'm confused. No, that's what I'm trying to find out. Was there an extinction event that wiped out pretty much everybody else, apart from maybe a few of the blondes who decided to take themselves to safety? It's not that they survived the extinction, but they found something that did, appreciated the knowledge of what they found, which was a library, and mastered it, and taught themselves and became exquisite kind of like what happened with the moors in spain Mm. where do you think he got algebra where do you think he got metallurgy real metallurgy he got it from the moors these were black people Mm. but they were elegant have you ever seen othello othello was a general for the city states of rome and he was black and when that play is performed He's made out to be black. And, uh, of course, he married Desdemona, and she was white, which... It's a bit of a no-no. Well, that's why Iago was so jealous, of course, and why Iago tried to destroy Othello and did. Got Othello convinced that Desdemona was cheating on him, so he kills Desdemona. And then the famous lines, know me as a man who loved... Not wisely, but too well. Famous lines. Famous lines. Do you know what Iago means in Italian? Devil. Yeah. So back to the Etruscans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And back to the Etruscans, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, all I'm trying to do is because we know that there were different lineages. 
I'm just going to throw this in there. The Olmec heads. They look very African in appearance. Yeah, they are. They're Numidian, yeah. and that's a great mystery. But the Olmecs were founded by the pre-Shang Chinese. The Warring States period's priests cast probably felt the need to get out of Dodge, and so they got a ship, and they came to the New World, and they hit the Pacific Coast, the Central America, and founded the Olmec Empire. They were the first monument builders in the New World in this okay, lineage. Right. right, in this lineage. Okay, so let's go back to the previous lineage. So what happened to all the people? <laughs> the ones, the ones that well, didn't survive. Well, you have to figure this, that roughly there's 20,000 years between an extinction and the first vestiges of civilization, of anything that you would call civilized. And in 20,000 years, all traces that have any weathering whatsoever, have any exposure to rain, water, or anything at all, are going to be gone. Okay. So how on earth did the Etruscans manage to weather 20,000 years? They must have Well, they didn't. Something. They didn't. They didn't live from a former extinction. They found a library from a former ah. extinction and probably some other things. But they revered it and they mastered it and they felt like this was God giving them a leg up. Gotcha. And maybe it was. You know, I can't so speak for God. So whose library was it that they found? Yeah. Where was it? Well, it was a library from the former extinction or from okay. the former lineage. In what form? Underground, overground, in some kind of technology or something? Is it similar to the Bushegi Mountain type thing? Well, I didn't have the the yeah. accommodations for nine foot people. No, it didn't have that, but it was similar in some ways. The superior technology that was there, they found things there that they can't understand today. They can't figure out how these things work. A number of the things that are there because Busegi is where ET came to show uh to try to correct the flaw that's with the split consciousness by showing the people how to correct the settings of the engines on Earth in the hopes that that would also align those machines that are in the moon, but they didn't. But that knowledge is still there. That information is still there. Yeah, it's there. It's there. And also they found a container with monatomic gold. No, okay, I read about monatomic gold, the fact that it is allegedly supposed to extend life. It is the elixir of life. Is this correct? Yeah, but it's no big deal. You can make it if you know how. But if you take it, is it going to extend your life if you're human? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to tell you where the fountain of youth is? <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, really? it's, it's not a lot of point. It's not going to be what you think. I can tell you how to take it, but you got to do exactly as I tell you, or you get Kill yourself. <laughs> really, really bad indigestion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they say that gold is non perishable, right? Non perishable yeah. metal. Do you know that it'll dissolve in aqua regia? And it's very hard to bring it back out of solution. And most people that try lose it. Does that sound like a non perishable metal? No, it doesn't. Now, you take titanium. Titanium is closer to being non-perishable. However, there's a way to get rid of it, too. If you know what you're doing, and you know to keep the temperature within a certain range, and using aqua regia, which is a mixture of two acids, and you powder the gold, or not powder it, but get as small a flakes as you can, and heat it up to where it turns red, and then drop it in aqua regia. Well, after you do that, then you shake it up. You make a type of filter, and you pour it on a cake pan, and let that dry out. Don't use any kind of heat. Just stick it out in the sun. Let it dry out. And you'll go out and see a film. Now, you're going to lose 10% of the gold, but that film is white gold. Hmm. Oh, interesting. So if you took a pound, you took a pound of that placer gold, 
gold dust, whatever you want to call it. If you took a pound of it, you'd end up with one ounce of white gold. Jesus. <laughs> you see, uh, that's, not see, lot, that's not a lot of comeback, is it? <laughs> see, no, but if you uh, take it, your chemistry has to be correct or it'll still bite you. But if you put it on your tongue and it doesn't bite you, then you swallow it. Very little, just a little bit. And uh, according to the alchemist, you have good thoughts for a good outcome. Hmm. And it'll make a lot of difference. James, just before we veer off on something else, what is the book? It's a book about alchemy. It's a really old book. Yeah, it's by Agricola, and it's Heres de Metallica. That's the one. Spell it for me, please. A-G-R-I-C-O-L-A. And capital A-R-E-S. Yeah. De, D-E, Metallica. Do you know that Agricola was an old style, kind of a cross between one of my adepts and an alchemist, and he had... A boy and a girl who were his helpers, who were his uh, apprentices. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they would do anything for him. I don't know what happened to them. I don't. But they were very, it was like a family. He was amazing. I liked him. There's a drawing of him in the book. There's lots of drawings in the book. It doesn't look like him, though. Oh, okay. It doesn't look like him. Whoever made that drawing probably never even saw him. Well, it was a very long time ago. Yeah, the whole chapter on Touchstone is actually quite fascinating because there's so much information in there. And the beautiful, beautiful drawings that were made as well. It's all in there. It's just, you yeah, found it's just it has all the stars in the sky and they're all shaped like little gold paste on stars you give children for doing well. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I think that's so yet. fun. Yeah. But there are so many illustrations, it would take me ages to go through it because it's such a huge book. But now i found it again, I'm actually quite pleased. That's interesting. I oh, See, I'm engrossed now. I, that, that's it, you guys have lost out. I found this book again. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I tell you Did what. Did tell you how to mitigate radiation? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, they didn't discover radiation then. They hadn't know. discovered radiation. You think I would tell anybody about that shit? Mm -hmm. They didn't know? Uh-uh. So what happened to the Etruscans then before we go? I mean, did they end up... I think they're still around. I think that there's probably... Uh, uh, they had learned some things that have not survived. Like I say, very sensual people. A lot of good qualities. I hope they've survived. They're going to be very secretive. They're going to probably have a great deal of money and know how to secrete themselves very well. So even when they were in Rome, their number was probably no more than 500. So if they were adepts, I know we've discussed adepts in the past, would they have longevity of sorts? I don't know, because they were not my kind of an adept. Right, okay, so your kind of adepts, yeah, because, yeah, we know of one who lived for a very long time, or was here for a very long time. Who was that? Oh, it slipped my mind. Saint Germain. Oh, Saint Germain, thank you. He wasn't always Saint Germain, he was somebody else, wasn't he? Well, it depends person. upon the time and the place. <laughs> Who he was. Mm. Uh, the French knew him as Saint Germain. What was his name again? Well, it depends on how far back you want to go. He was the magician, wasn't he? He set up the. He was the one that, that warned you, that met yeah. you and warned you, James, not George. Yeah. I know. In case anyone thinks. Oh, it's gone out of my head. No, it's gone. I don't want to say his name over recording it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine, fine. But the uh, magician that we're talking about, who I went to see here in Fort Worth, yeah, when I first saw him, it was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was coming back from emergency leave, and I was at a stop over at the bus stop, and that's he walked right. up while I was reading Catcher in the Rye and asked me, I feel like a conversation. 
And I told him I'd prefer intelligent conversation anytime. So he sat down and we had a strange conversation. Years later, I didn't give him my name. He didn't give me his. And years later, I came across his niece under some odd circumstances and began to realize what it was he asked me to do and why. Rather interesting. And it turned out, yes, I'm pretty sure who he was. Because I had all of his papers, read them all, before I returned them. That's right, yeah, you did. You had a car full, didn't you? It was shoved in the boot. Yeah, that little Chevy, the little one. I had that, and it was full. I mean, I couldn't put another box in it. He was the one that found you and wanted you to look at the the stuff that was there, like the Chinese. The emperor's emperor's robes. Well, I had a friend at the time that was running one of these Mediterranean-style decor places, you know, for people that wanted to do their homes in Mediterranean style, amphoras and things like that. And she came in. She was interested in remodeling the house that her uncle had left her. And she told him that she had a lot of Chinese antiques and wanted to know if she knew anybody that could give her an idea what they were worth. So she was considering selling some to pay for redecorating the house. It had a Roman bath. It had all kinds of stuff in it. Also had a stage on which he performed for the wealthy of Fort Worth in the house. And so I went out, and whenever I walked in the house, walked in through a bedroom off the garage. And there on a vestibule in a bedroom was a picture of the man. I recognized him. From the man you met who you had the conversation with years and years before. Yeah, hadn't changed a bit. Certain things about him tell me that, you know, that... So, of course, St. Germain wore a periwig. And, uh, you know, used powder on his face to to hide the fact that he was hairless and that he had an orange complexion. Orange, really orange. But when I met him, he didn't have a periwig, didn't have any white powder on his face. Mm. It's really bugging me, his name. We can't see it anyway. Wren was the first. Yeah, thank you. Well, if, I don't want to bring anything, you know, about his niece. She's still alive, I'm sure. Yeah, I've got it. A sweet got girl, it. married to a real son of a bitch. So, you know, there was the picture, but also the collection that he had was pretty extraordinary. Oh, he had something very extraordinary. Mm. Oh, God, we could go for hours into this, because there's... Who was also a member who then went on to end up being hung upside down. Oh, Crowley. Yeah. But Crowley wasn't an adept, was he? He wanted to be, but he didn't get to that point. He wasn't allowed to. No, Crowley was the center of the parlor world in England. You know, curiosity among the rich. And people used him for interpreting dreams and different things. You have to be real careful with people like that. And let's face it, he's not a person that really we should be bringing back into consciousness, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Right, listen, my brain's gone to mush. As much as I would super love to carry on this, I think we should do it again. And I'm going to have to go to sleep because I haven't worked tomorrow. (laughs) Okay, well, I think we've done what we could for profit. But I think Myra is very, very correct in saying that we need to keep the blog alive. We need to keep your knowledge and experience and information out there. We need to keep adding to it because, believe it or not, you have a huge loyal following of people who want to hear from you. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So, therefore, we need to do this more often. Even if it's just a chin wag, I'm sure to God, well, well, let's face it, a chin wag is never a chin wag with you, is it? You always find something interesting out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was thinking we didn't need it to be so long, but it's turned out long this time, but it doesn't always have to be a long no. one. But, you know, people kind of complain if it's too long. I don't understand that because I listen to very long interviews and I can listen to them while I'm doing other things and yeah, I like I that, you know. I but I think it's essential at the moment. 
I think we need to keep doing it as much as possible. Well, ladies, I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. Great. Right, okay, let's call this a wrap. Late in the morning or early in the morning for you guys, you still need to get some shut-eye. Yeah, I do. I'm up early as well. It's 20 to 2, goodness. I know. All right, guys, enjoyed it. Right, I'm off. Good night. Good night.